Good morning. Welcome to the ninth meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. Before we move to the first item of the agenda, I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices, as these may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, the first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take items five and six in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Uh, Agenda item two uh, is uh, to take evidence on the Conservation of Salmon Scotland Amendment Regulations 2018 SSI 2018 from officials who have been involved in its construction. And I would like to welcome Simon Dryden, the Policy Team Manager, Salmon and Recreational Fisheries, Keith Main, Policy Manager, Salmon and Recreational Fisheries, Marine Scotland, and Stuart Middlemas, Ecologist, Marine Scotland Science, Freshwater Water Fisheries. We will also, in the course of the next week, well, be welcoming Jackie Bailey, MSP, who is joining the committee for this item. Uh, so, gentlemen, we'll move on straight on to uh, looking at this issue. Um, could you explain um, the methodology that's been uh, used to arrive at the position you've arrived at? Uh, could you outline whether uh, it would stand, you believe it would stand up to peer review, and has it indeed been reviewed independently? The, in brief, there, there's lots of details. It's a quite a complex modelling process, but essentially, we take the catches provided for each of the <clears throat> rivers in Scotland use those catches to work out how many salmon coming back, um, turn the number of salmon into the number of eggs, and compare that to an egg target for a given river. If it's above the egg target, then um, essentially exploitation or killing is allowed. If it's below the egg target, it, the river becomes catch and release. That's a very standard process that's used internationally. Um, and, and that's been peer reviewed in a number of places, so they do things essentially the same methodology in Norway um, and Ireland. So the general process has been peer reviewed and it would stand up to peer review. Um, we use Scotland specific information rather than taking information from say Norway and applying it to Scotland. That bit hasn't been peer reviewed but it has been subject to a large amount of scrutiny by going to consultation um, discussions pre-consultation with um, Fishes Management Scotland, local biologists, local trusts, uh, etc. So I think we have considered uh, and will continue to consider getting it peer-reviewed in the scientific literature, but that takes time and we have a balance between going through that process and making the changes that through our consultation and various discussions have been suggested. I hear what you're saying, but would not some system of peer review get you into a position where you might be open to less criticism about the methodology than, than you've had? It, in, indeed, and, and part of this is down to the, the speed that we, we have to get things in place. And as I say, the balance between making the changes that have been suggested uh, by other people and updating the methodology and taking the time, essentially pausing. Peer review is not a quick process, uh, but but I accept, and it is something we're we're actively looking at and seeing how we can do that. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. Um, just on that matter of peer review, uh, apparently at a meeting in October in 2017, um, you were asked by the the Loch Lomond um, uh, angling, um, the Loch Lomond Angling Improvement Association, um, if Marine Scotland would stand by the current methodology, and if you would put your name to a scientific paper on the calculation method and data used, and apparently you re replied that you would not at that meeting. I don't have a recollection of saying that, and that's... It certainly makes it awkward, because this is a letter that I've received from um, Gareth Burhill um, of that association, uh, dated the 4th of March, among other things. 
Um, I think, you know, I... I, I, I earlier, in addition, that you use a completely different methodology. Uh, you use a Scottish solution, um, which is not, which is based on catch um, rather than the, than the eggs, uh, rather than the, the young fish available to, to measure. We don't use the young fish available to measure, but um, need, need practice. No, that that's not the accepted. Pra the accepted practice is, is to use adults. That's what they use in Ireland. That's what they use generally in England and Wales. That's what they use in, in Norway. So uh, we, we are doing what is international best practice. We just use data specific to Scotland. So the way we, mm -hmm. we correct catches to figure out numbers coming back to the river, we don't use the information that they use in Norway because that's specific to Norway. We use the best information for Scotland. So the general uh, method is what's used internationally. I. As I say, I don't have a recollection of saying I wouldn't put my name to it. And as I said, we will be looking to peer review this. And of course, um, I will put my name to it. I'm, we're not hiding from it. We're, we're here. We go out to speak to people. We've spoken to local and angling associations, spoken to the um, biologists, uh, local trust biologists, local boards, etc. So I think that's... Uh, Simon Dragon, do you want to come in there? Uh, yes, perhaps as a, if I could uh, give a further example of this balance between going for peer review and, and developing the model. Uh, one of the, the feedback that we've had from the local biologists is that the current uh, egg requirement target we use is a, is a national target. So just to get a little bit of detail, what that means is that we currently, uh, the model chooses an egg target between 1.1 and 9.8 eggs, 9 .8 eggs per square metre is, is of, the, of the wetted area is the requirement. And we've had constructive feedback to say, well, look, not all rivers in Scotland are the same, and that range uh, doesn't apply to all rivers. And we've said, right, we, well, we will look at that. And what our, uh, we aspire to do with the model this year is to have a more refined egg target, and we'll try and look at the data to see whether that suggests you can do so. And we might find, for example, that on the east coast, the range uh, could be larger than on the west coast and have a smaller range. If that were the case, that there were a smaller range, uh, the, the egg target range was smaller on the uh, west coast, then that would reduce the egg requirement on the west coast rivers. What you're doing is taking that range and doing 10,000 iterations and choosing a figure between the range. So if you make it smaller, it's better. And if we can do that, I think uh, local biologists uh, would agree with us that we would have improved the model again. But it takes quite a substantial amount of time and research to make sure that we do that properly. Would it be fair to say that this is a work in progress? Absolutely. It is, is very much a work in progress. We've improved it from the 2006 model uh, e each year. Uh, we have improved it. And there are some calls to say, well, why... why uh, if you're improving the model, uh, why don't you not have any grades until you're happy that uh, you've, got, you've got the best possible model? Uh, and the answer is, look, we don't think it's an option to do nothing. Uh, all the evidence we have suggests that sat the number of adults returning to Scottish rivers is, is reducing dramatically. Uh, the catch numbers tell us that. The anecdotal evidence from this year uh, uh, tell us that, that, that that numbers are reducing and, and we need, we believe, to offer protection, uh, uh, have a balanced approach for today's anglers, but for anglers in the future. If we allow today's anglers to kill too many salmon, then there might not be any salmon for, for future anglers in some rivers. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, convener. If this question can be answered relatively briefly, the answer would be useful. If it's a long answer, it probably won't be. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm just used to the, uh, the uh, regime around conservation in the oceans as representing the constituency I do. And the ISIS uh, international collaboration of scientists that's existed for over 100 years and continues to refine its process even, even after 100 years. And I just wondered if there was a quick, pithy way of saying how similar the process is that ISIS and the contributing nations use is to what you are doing uh, in our salmon rivers in terms of scientific approach. Very similar. The, 
There's an ICES working group on, on salmon. Um, some of the ideas uh, that we've used in Scotland have come from there, and it's been discussed with international colleagues, um, the approach. Kate Forbes. Uh, just two uh, brief questions. Where there are gaps in the available data and information, how do you take that into account when classifying rivers? I'll, I'll answer that on the, the kind of broad broad scale. Is so th th there, there's lots of data gaps because we don't have perfect information for each river, but we have to uh, use the best available information. So in many cases, we use the all Scotland um, average information. We're, we're, so the, the conversion to go from catches to numbers of fish, we have that specifically for a set number of rivers. Where we don't, we either use an all Scotland, or if we can find some kind of geographic uh, relationships, how it changes through Scotland, we'll use that. But that's generally how we uh, and other um, countries fill in the, the kind of missing information. I do. Just to add specifically, we're, we're aware, uh, particularly in relation to the, to the River Endrick, that, that uh, uh, we have missing catch data specifically uh, rod catch data. And the model does not uh, add in additional salmon, uh, additional salmon catches to try to take account of catches which have not been, uh, not been reported. We, that, that would just be, uh, we think, uh, too subjective and uh, too risky uh, of, uh, to try and design a method to do so. so but in the case of the R River Endrick, uh, We've liaised with the Loch Lomond uh, uh, Fisheries Trust, and we've identified that there's some uh, just over 11 kilometres of river that is that does have fishing on it, for which we don't have the data. That's both on on both banks, taking into account both banks, and we equate that to be about 21% of the assessed river area. Uh, so if we were which we don't think would be a sound basis, but if we were to uplift the catches by 21% to say that they were pro rata, uh, that's, that would be uplift the catches by 24, and that would not have made the River Endrick uh, grade two. Okay. Uh, you've raised that particular issue, so let's explore that now. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, uh, Convener. Good morning to you all. Um, in correspondence that has been passed on to me through the constituency MSP Jackie Bailey uh, with, the, um, with the group, um, it has been highlighted in a slightly different way to um, what you have said, Simon, which, and I, and I, and I just want to highlight that, the date that they say that the data is only being collected from a 16 um, kilometre stretch of the river, despite it being 46 kilometres long, and the club only has right rights to that 16 kilometres, and they consider fish count as the only way to accurately define the numbers. Um, they do not consider um, any improvements have been made to the way the data has been, um, been captured. Um, and I do appreciate this is a very complex issue. Uh, I think um, if you could comment on that and also on the fact more generally that fish counters, that, as I understand it from the Scottish Government information, that if, if I've got this right, that there's only six in Scotland, that's increased to eight. And I wonder if you could sort of shed light on that at all as well. Certainly. The, uh, the, it, it may be easier if we, if we follow the, this up in writing to I explain the differences on the, on the river length. But uh, when we uh, do an assessment, we uh, take into account what's described as, as the wetted area, the areas in the catchment area that salmon uh, can, can reside, and uh, what we might call that the assessment area. Now, now that isn't all 15, uh, all of the river length in the case of, of the Endrick. And then we may have some differences when we say, well, it's not simply the, ri the river length, that it's more appropriate to count left and right banks. But from the information we've been given from the Lot Lomond Trust, and we sat down with them for a substantial period of time, and, and they mapped out the river and drew it out for us, and uh, we, we are fairly confident that we're talking about 21% of, of the river area that we don't have catch data. Now, uh, uh, sorry, that we don't, 21% that we don't. Sorry, my mistake. Yes, yeah. 
uh, 21% that we don't. Now, uh, in, in terms of fish counters, yes, fish, fish counters do remove uh, 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 or decrease the uncertainty uh, in the data, and uh, it, it would be helpful to have uh, more fish counters. But there is a balance to be struck, because clearly, with, for example, this year, uh, SEPA uh, are spending uh, around about £7 million removing barriers from rivers, which obviously helps the migration of salmon. Uh, so we're reticent to uh, build a barrier, even though it has a fish pass and counter in it. That would seem to be counterintuitive. So we need to, to look for places where the barrier can't be removed and, and a fish pass and counter can be put in. Uh, that's it's an expensive process, and it's not just putting the counter in place. It needs a lot of maintenance, ongoing maintenance and, and analysis. So it's a, a challenging process. Uh, we did find on the River Ettrick uh, an opportunity this year, and we gave some funding, and we, that salmon uh, counter should go live in the next few weeks. That's surely something that volunteers would be only too keen to do in terms of your costs, wouldn't they? Uh, is, hope... is that something that citizen science could... Be involved in? Uh, we'd, we would hope so, and we'd certainly look to exploit those opportunities. Thanks. Um, having been name checked, I'm going to invite Jackie Bailey uh, to come in there. But before I do so, can I invite her to declare any interest she may have in relation to the instrument? Thank you very much, convener, and my apologies for being held up in traffic. Um, the only interest I would declare, not that it is a registrable inter interest, is that, uh, unsurprisingly, Loch Lomond Angling Improvement Association is in my constituency. Um, it it is a matter of regret, Convener, that this isn't the first time we've been here. Um, your predecessor committee, of which you were a member, considered this um, way back in, in 2016, I believe. Um, and the, some of the discussion then, as far as I recall, was the lack of an evidence base for the regulations that were, were brought forward. And, and I regret that we seem to be in a similar position. Um, so can I ask the officials um, what discussions they had with uh, Loch Lomond Angling Improvement Association, and when? We've had uh, discussions uh, opening up in uh, specifically on the assessment uh, in October in October uh, this year, uh, and have had uh, quite uh, extensive dialogue with them on, via the phone, meetings, and, and emails in that period to try and uh, explain how the model's working to, for example, I note that in correspondence we've received from them, there was a concern that we had not used the same wetted area that we did in 2016 uh, for this assessment. And we've, uh, we certainly have, we have not uh, changed the wetted area. We've, we've taken on board the suggestions which we did at that time and, and have remained consistent in our approach. No, knowing the difficulties that there were with the lack of evidence for this stretch of water, why did you wait 18 months, almost a you know, couple of months before you were bringing forward new regulations, to actually engage with the association? Uh, that, that's partly due to a, uh, a, a change in uh, a personnel. I mean, I'm not, I'm not excusing what the uh, Marine Scotland has done, but uh, my team, uh, the team has changed completely, uh, and uh, I was unaware of uh, the missing data until it was uh, uh, escalated again, highlighted to me in October last year. Stuart Middlemass was there. I see him quoted in the official report for March 2016. I, we have been in contact with um, various people to try and get catch data. Um, it's not something I deal with myself, but that, that, that's no excuse. So that has been taken forward to some extent, but obviously not successfully. So I think there's an acknowledgement the data is, is very clearly incomplete um, and you've made assumptions based on a fraction of the river. Endrick, would that be correct? Well, we, we have, uh, when, we, when it was uh, highlighted in October of 2017, uh, we have established through subsequent meetings and uh, with the L Lohman Trust, for which we... Uh, tried to identify, see if they would identify all the proprietors. Now, that the sensitive issue here is that uh, 
uh, we fully respect and understand that the association, the Lot Loan Angling Improvement Association and the trust uh, find it, don't feel able to give us the contact details of who the owners are. Uh, so, so despite us asking for that, but we understand because it's a statutory requirement to make a return, that that's difficult. So uh, 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 they provided with some information and that's allowed us to establish that we're missing 21% of, of the data. But they do uh, say to us anecdotally, this is the Loch Lomond Fisheries Trust, that the catches in that area were almost nil negligible. But I accept we don't have returns. Uh, just on Friday last week, uh, one of uh, what, we, what the Scottish Government announced was a new Wild Fisheries Governance Fund. Uh, and now that does give the opportunity for both those bodies or other proprietors uh, to make a bid to establish a District Salmon Fishery Board uh, with a grant of up to £50,000. Now, the process of establishing, if that, there are, there are a number of potential benefits uh, from so doing, uh, but one one of those is that the process of establishing a board would uh, involve the sheriff making up a role of all the proprietors in the district. So that is a potential option, a potential way that we could move forward. Uh, and I will be in contact with both bodies to uh, revisit with them now that the, the situation has changed and there is funding available to help. Uh, if they so wish to move to a board, uh, I'll, I'll discuss that with them. That indeed sounds very positive, convener, but, but the difficulty I have is that this is coming um, after you want the regulations passed. So you know, surely a government that prides itself on evidence-based policy making would gather the evidence first. Can, can I ask you, um, as probably a final question, because the convener's nodding at me, um, you know, it, what are the consequences of making this a Category 3 river? Have you thought those through? Because Loch Lomond Angling Association spends quite a considerable amount of money employing bailiffs, um, engaging in conservation projects. If their membership drops, which it will, if this moves through a Category 3 river, that will go. Surely that's not the consequence we would all want to see. And I would therefore ask, perhaps we should wait for the evidence before moving ahead with this particular river system. We, uh, we are aware of, of, of the risks, in particular, you say, to, uh, about angling numbers of having uh, uh, rivers at uh, grade three. But our 2006 uh, data does not suggest that... Uh, yes. Well, what, what I would say is that when, when we look at the Grade 3 rivers uh, in 2016 and look at the catches and compare them with Grade 2 and 1 rivers, we have not found that the catches have dropped dispropor disproportionately. So if you, if you had expected that... It, once you put a grade three river, you designate a river grade three, anglers are going to stop or move elsewhere. You might expect then the catch in those rivers to fall quite considerably, but they have not fallen more than the catches have fallen in grade one or two rivers, which if they were being displaced, you might have thought those rivers indeed would go up. Indeed, I see on the River Endrick that in 2000, in its last year, uh, in 2016, its catch was 113 salmon. Okay, when it, now, if I may finish, that was when it was a grade three river in 2016. That catch is higher than the three preceding years when it did not have a grade. So if in 2016, when we made it a grade three, the Lot Lomond Angling Improvement Association lost members, as they predict they will do this year. We might have expected catches to go down. They did not. They went up. They were only two below the five-year average, which was 115. So we haven't seen it. A final point I'd say is that the fish counters, where we do have the fish counters, we count the catch upstream of those fish counters, and we have not seen a uh, re reduction in a, a different relationship between the fish going through the counters and the catch. If there was less, eff less effort, you would expect the catch rate, the proportion of, of salmon caught above the fish counters to have reduced. And we simply haven't seen that.
Um, Mr Dryden quite properly um, pointed to a reduction in membership of the Loch Lomond Association. The reduction this time would be significant. I asked you specifically about the impact on um, local bailiff projects, conservation projects. I'm not sure that you answered that. Um, and I would, of course, be interested in your view because that, that would be a consequence that I don't think anybody wants to see, um, particularly on the basis of data which is incomplete, where not all proprietors have been identified, not all the catch has been identified, um, and it doesn't add up to evidence-based policy making in my book. Uh, we clearly we, we have a balance to make that as i say that if we made uh rivers that we uh grade to and uh, killing went on then we believe that would would could jeopardize the stock for future anglers and mean uh that some rivers could become moribund uh what we have just announced again on friday is uh, an additional 500,000 pounds of funding for the wild sector to help with uh, research, to help with activities to address the 12 high level pressures that we have identified are on uh, salmon stocks. So we are, you know, we are, we are putting a lot more funding into the sector this financial year and that will include activity that, that will happen uh, in the uh, Loch Lomond catchment area. Claudia okay. Beamish has got a question she wants to ask and then Finlay Carson. Uh, Thank you very much, convener. Uh, it's to ask, and whoever feels appropriate to answer this question, um, what would be the implications um, if there was, and I stress the word if, there was a movement, um, if there was um, uh, uh, an a motion, sorry, to, or rather than a movement, <laughs> uh, to annul the SSI? And could you clarify, I understand that um, the current 2016 regulations are not time limited, but the prime primary legislation may be required um, to review and update every two years. So um, if there are concerns of the nature that are being highlighted, I'm wondering if there was a move to annul uh, what would actually happen, because it obviously is an EU directive. There are protected species, and um, this committee, of course, has serious concerns about that. We also want to get it right. Can the... Um the regulations that we have at the moment, if there was a motion uh, to annul and the, the, that motion was carried, um, we would revert to the previous years, uh, the, the 2016 amendment regulations. So um, it, you're quite right, they're not time limited, they would continue for, uh, for the 2018 fishing season. Um, that would have implications for a large number of rivers because the uh, it's uh, we're concentrating uh, for reasons I understand on the Loch Lomond system and for the, the Endrick Water, but um, there are quite a, a large number of rivers which will be Grade Three this year. And as part of the public consultation that we did in September October, we've had a lot of representations about this. Um, that wasn't an entire surprise, to be honest, to a lot of the fishing community because the stocks of salmon and the catches of salmon have been on a downward trend for quite a while. Um, and therefore, that's why we think that in, in the, the entirety of the regulations that, that, that are, are currently being considered by the committee, that this is, is, is the right way to go. I mean, simply arithmetically, a five-year average, which is how we model the, uh, the salmon. Um, we, we lost 2011, which was a very good year, a very healthy year for salmon catches, and brought in uh, 2016, which, if I remember rightly, was something like 63% of the catches of the 2011 figure. Um, so there, there would be um, potentially wide implications now. That would mean that a lot of rivers, which, which would be Grade 3 this year, may stay at Grade 2, for example, and that would allow killing. Uh, of, of salmon, um, whether that's restricted or by local arrangement, there would, there would be management arrangements in place. Um, as to primary legislation, I'm, I'm not sure that that's the case. The, the primary legislation and, and, and the regulations as, uh, at its base require an annual review of the position for the, I think it's 17 Stuart, um, special areas, uh, SACs um, around the country, and we will continue to review them year on year. Um, there's not a requirement to make annual regulations. Um, 
uh, so that's that's a commitment that uh, I believe Cabinet Secretary, when the first regulations came into place, had said we would we would look for an annual review, and, and as a result, this is the first set of regulations coming forward. Um, for England, for example, they last week went to a public consultation on uh, similar conservation measures um, for their 42 principal salmon rivers, and those would be 10-year bylaws with a five-year review. Um, now, many of those rivers, uh, under the terms of the consultation of the bylaws came into place, many of the rivers in England uh, would go to mandatory catch and release, the equivalent of our grade three, for a 10-year period. With, with very little scope for review. Um, what we are doing is, as, as Simon has said and as Stuart has said before me, is we are continuing to develop and, and improve our model year on year. Um, there are hard years, and this is going to be a hard year for quite a number of river systems, and we understand that, but we will continue to review it. We are continuing to invest in improving the wild fisheries, and hopefully that will start to see some improvements and we can, as part of our annual review process. We'll, we'll, we'll bring forward regulations again. We've already started this year to think about the regulations for 2019. Uh, very briefly, Finlay Carson. Um, just in the back of uh, Jackie Bailey's question, I, I'm, I'm really concerned that when you flag a river as Grade 3, it sends a big message out there that people shouldn't come and fish it. And, and, and therefore, the, the fishing effort is reduced. And I, and I think that that's quite clear. There is less fishing effort in Grade 3. I certainly, given the choice between Grade 1, 2 or 3, I would pick grade one, not because I wanted to kill fish necessarily, it's because I wanted to go to a river that was healthy and had more chance of catching a fish. Um, does the, the 500,000 go any way to mitigate the reduction in investment that angling societies and, and uh, organisations are looking after the, the, the health of the rivers, does that go any way to mitigate the reduction in income that they get and inve therefore the investment they have in these rivers? It, we, are, uh, we haven't finalised uh, how we will uh, uh, spend all of the, uh, the 500,000 in this financial year, but we are liaising with uh, Fisheries Management Scotland to look at uh, uh, giving seed funding to a potential, uh, to a scheme that would uh, be looking to uh, increase angling participation and be particularly based on young anglers and uh, 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 yeah, particularly based on young anglers. Uh, we are just in the, at, at the same time when we first introduced the regulations in uh, 2016, we gave uh, £100,000 to FishPal to help angling clubs. Uh, and, and that funding uh, uh, is still being utilised and the scheme will run through till June and FishPal are hopeful that they can extend it voluntarily uh, with clubs. And, and in conversations with, with angling clubs that I've been to, that does seem to have had a positive impact where they have taken up uh, uh, the advice and, for example, created Facebook pages, etc., and seem to have increased the number of visiting anglers uh, that they get. Just on the back of Fish Pal, have you done any consultation regarding the, the effectiveness of Fish Pal? Because my understanding was Fish Pal did a lot of that work anyway, and all that happened was the Scottish Government uh, offset some of their costs, and it didn't actually add anything else to what was already out there. Can I, can I say that the uh, FishPal uh, have built on their existing model, and again, are, are continuing to develop that. What the, the um, government's investment of £100,000 over the two years has done has um, helped them to extend their offering, if you like, uh, to modernise it a little and to go out to clubs who haven't been engaged and, uh, and to river systems who haven't been engaged uh, with Fish Pal before and, as Simon said, perhaps haven't had the social media or the public-facing uh, presence that, that Fish Pal can offer. And over the course of the two years so far, Fish Pal have brought on uh, something over 80, but they're talking to another 40 or so clubs at the moment to bring them on, and and that that gives them, that gives each club, um, it, it, they can tailor make it, but it gives them a, a a better and more obvious internet presence. It gives the potential for online booking for people who want to fish. It gives um, day by day and and almost hour by hour uh, conditions in the water and and the number of catches. So um, it's been. Yes, it's been building on, on an existing uh, model, but um, it's, 
it's brought on clubs who haven't had to pay the initial fee, which I think was something like £250, if I remember, to, 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 to register. Um, and then for the duration of the project, Fishpal have not been charging commission on any bookings taken, etc. So there's, there's been that offer for two years, and uh, quite a number of clubs have taken it up. Claudia Beamish and here. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, could we um, look more generally, please, um, from yourselves as the panel, um, for some sort of an estimate of the scale of concerns around the regrading of river systems um, for other river systems which have not been highlighted so far. And could you comment in relation to that on um, what happened in 2016 when some of us were in the pre on the previous committee? Um, it was highlighted that there would be more granularity and locality to the development of the science. And in the context of concerns, um, and, and how, how those two interface with each other. Um, could, could you comment on that, please? I'll let Keith go first on the first part of the question. In, in terms of um, this year and the level of concern, um, as we've done in previous years, we had a, there was a statutory requirement for a, a minimum 28-day public consultation. Um, it, it depends how far you go back, but around this time last year, our scientific colleagues were gathering all the data from the previous year. Um, doing the, the science, doing the, um, the, the 10,000 iteration run on the model and, and, and came up with the um, proposed classifications. We went to public consultation on that in September. Um, we had um, over 190 responses back. I have to say that more than 50% of them were with regard to the Loch Lomond Association. Um, but those concerns were about... Uh, no, they weren't about, they were 32 river systems um, came back to us. Some were one letter on behalf of the, of, of the District Salmon Fishery Board, some were a number of letters, and they ranged from uh, fairly short concerns that, um, as, as Mr Carson has said, concerns that a river was, was going uh, to, to be Grade 3 for the first time, to very detailed scientific um, uh, concerns. This is the third year we've consulted, and some of those uh, more detailed things, I, I think, although I'm fairly new to the team, have been uh, discussed for the previous two lots of regulations. Uh, my, my predecessors uh, spent a lot of time going around Scotland and, and, and the clubs and discussing in detail the fact that there are things that need to improve and, and as we've talked about, are developing on the model as we go. Um, but. Uh, we have responded to some of those concerns. Uh, we've not been able to respond to all of them, but, for example, um, some of the systems, I think se seven systems this year, which were previously going to be Grade 2, we have decided are going to be Grade 1 because we've responded to concerns about uncertainties in, in the way in which the fish use loch systems. Um, as to the granularity, Stuart might be able to... Yes, the, the first year of regulations were was at a district level, so that could involve a number of of rivers, and we undertook to move that on to a river level. So there was a large process involved, um, consultation with, with fisheries to be able to get the statistics at a river level, and we've since done that for the, for the past two years. So that's one of the main changes. We've increased granularity in, in that respect. Um, the other kind of main changes are we've went out and consulted on the distribution of salmon in a number of areas. Um, and we've had over 3,000 changes to the distribution, so the information that we had, which we've then taken on board and fed into the, the models. There was a lot of discussion um, previously that we don't take into account, or we didn't, couldn't take into account angling conditions. The models we've produced take into account the, the flow in the river, essentially when it's particularly dry conditions, there's less chance of catching fish, so we take that into account. So if it's um, poor conditions, we account for that in the models as best we can. Can you explain a little more about that, and also more generally how the um, how effort from anglers has um, been taken into account? Because I've had that highlighted to me by the Nith and Annan groups that they have concerns about that um, in relation to the number of anglers being down and. Um, that there are some, club, some uh, clubs, particularly on Grade 3, which does somewhat contradict the information that you've given us earlier as a panel, um, have got numbers going down. So how does that relate, please? Bri bri briefly, the conditions are, if, if there's not much water 
uh, essentially it's harder to catch fish. No one's exactly sure why, but it could be that salmon aren't moving, moving as much. But sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not being clear. My que my question. The yeah. Thing, okay. Next part. Yeah, but it, it's about yeah. the effort. If the if there are, isn't, isn't so much fishing going on. Um, we um, we don't regularly nobody regularly collects information on effort, so we can't put that into any modelling. However, we accept um, that this is is an issue, and we have tried to collect effort information in the past, but but it's proved quite difficult. We're aware of a number um, and speaking to a number of different groups that are trying to collect effort. Galloway Fisheries Trust um, have some funding to look at effort, so we're discussing with, with them about what could be collected, what's feasible to collect. It's different where you've got an angling club as to where you've got a private beat. So, as I say, we're in discussions with them about what can be done, and then that's part of a process to figure out how we could use it in the future. It's not something we could go... We feel we could go out and say, people must collect this information, and, and we will then use that next year. On a... As a first, sorry, as a, as, a, as a first kind of step, we did ask um, when people filled in their catch returns yes. whether they would just let us know whether they fished that month or not. Because but at the would moment, would that not skew the results? Is my question, which has been raised with me by um, by some of the ones along the Solway. It, it it will be. We don't quite. We don't know how. We we don't have a handle on that. So we need to collect okay. information on effort so we can go from anecdotal information to something we can use. As I say, we, we asked just the simple kind of question of whether people had fished that month, because that way we could tell a zero catch return from people fishing and they're not being fished. Uh, and we didn't get, I think it was about 70% of people filled that, just to tick box in. So there are difficulties getting that information. But as I say, we're working with people like Galway Fisheries Trust in how we do that. Right. In any, of our, in any biological model, model we accept, there are in, inherent uncertainties and uh, the uh, uh, effort pro produce a lot of, of uncertainties. At, you know, how much time do you actually spend fishing and, and how good are you at, at, at fishing? What, what we are, what we are uh, s want to spend a, a considerable amount of this extra funding doing is looking at what anglers have called for, which is for a complementary juvenile assessment model. And that's where you go into uh, rivers, you select appropriate sample points, you electrofish, and you count the numbers of very small uh, juveniles. And now we need to, uh, we've got funding in place this year and a system uh, where we can do that across Scotland and then try and build a model to say, well, what would we predict the densities of the, of the small fish should be, the juvenile fish should be in rivers if they were healthy? Do for that yet? There's a methodology for how how we uh, do the electrofishing, yeah. where we do the electrofishing, yeah. uh, but we haven't finalised the modelling to say uh, to predict what the densities should be in each of the areas. That is oh, ongoing, and we're hoping to produce a report next year in 2019 with the first outputs of that. Yeah, and then we would have two models, both with uncertainties. We would have an adult model and a mm. juvenile model, mm. but at least we would have two models and we could compare the results. Right, thank you. OK, we really need to move this on. I'm going to allow two very brief supplementaries on this section. Firstly, Richard Lyle, then Jackie Bailey. Yeah, yeah. Not an exact science. Are you basically telling us that if we don't do this, uh, the anglers of the future won't have any fish to catch? I am genuinely saying that is a significant risk, and that's what... But you made one comment, and I'll be quick. You made one comment. You actually said when uh, a river was designated uh, down the way or, or whatever, the catches actually went up. It did on the river the, uh, the, uh, on the river Endrick. I said the catch is in 2016 were higher than the three previous years. Yep. The good news about that was that uh, all of those uh, fish were released, whereas in the previous years uh, some of the fish caught. So we're doing retained. this for conservation. We're absolutely doing this. For Thank you. Released survive. That's right. We, we may well uh, start some research this year to, to look more closely at uh, 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 rod uh, caught mortalities that were released. Uh, at the moment, the model uh, assumes that 10% of those released uh, will die. And, and that's based on some research, some historic research, but we want to check whether that figure remains valid, whether it's too high or too low. But we do take a cautionary approach at the moment.
Uh, Jackie Bailey. Briefly, um, I think it's true to say that all rivers are different. You would acknowledge that, and therefore you can't generalise in, 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 in a way about it, which is why evidence is so important in deciding what you're doing, and there is a lack of it, um, certainly in the Lumen system. I wonder whether I could ask you something I asked in, in um, March 2016, which is, have you done an equality impact assessment on this? And if so, would you provide that to the committee? The reason I ask is um, 30, if not 40 per cent of the members of Loch Lomond Angling Association um, have protected characteristics. I would uh, have to go and, and look at that. I understand. I, I, I know it was a question you raised before. Um, I think the Cabinet Secretary at the time uh, gave an assurance that an equality impact assessment had been done. I'm not quite sure at what stage that was, but I will check and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll write on it. So I would welcome if you've done that this time. Perhaps you could write to the committee ahead of next week on that and perhaps also, insofar as you can, provide information on the scale and the natures of the concerns that were expressed by the 32 uh, rivers that you referred to. That would be useful for members to have. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. Um, I'm one of these ineffective uh, fishermen. Uh, who contribute to effort but not to catching. Uh, and 50 years ago, my brother and I uh, were water billers for 40 kilometres of the day, uh, <laughs> but not for rod fishing, essentially for commercial netting. So a wee bit, uh, wee bit different. But in my constituency, where we have offshore fishing, the whole approach to the conservation has been that you need to prove there's enough fish before you're allowed to go and catch them. And the fishermen have suffered over about five years significant constraints on catching a particular cod. But now we have a superabundance of cod, one would almost say. Should it be the case that when you're looking at moving a grading from two to three, that it should be on the precautionary principle whereby you only highly rate a river if you can prove that it would be sustainable to allow fish to be taken and killed from that river. Because it seems the discussion so far has been the other way around, where the burden of proof has to, seems to be you have to prove it goes down in categorisation. Whereas looking at what's happened in whitefish offshore, the proof has been in the other direction. You have to prove there are fish to catch before moving it up to catchable status. Which approach are we actually uh, taking when we're looking, in particular, from two to three is, is perhaps the critical one. I, I think we are taking an approach where we, we, f we feel there is sufficient uh, fish to, to catch. So we're saying that the, uh, it will only be a grade two uh, where we judge that there's a 60% chance or more over each of a five-year reference period. Uh, the average over each of uh, five, year, five years is great. There's Stop you for a second. You said 60%. Over 60% gets you into two? Yes, it does. Right, OK. It does. Over 60% gets... I yep. just checked to my right here to make sure. But, yeah, over 60% uh, uh, gets, gets you into two. So you take... Uh, what, what the model does is uh, says, what is the chance of meeting the requirement in each of five years? And, uh, uh, and then averages, so takes the mean of, of the, the statistic... <laughs> At the percentage given in each of those five years. Uh, so we are saying that uh, for a grade two river, we believe there is a, greater, a 60 or greater percent chance of the egg requirement being met. And for a grade one, we're saying there's a 80% uh, or more chance of the egg requirement being met. But, but my fundamental point is the burden of proof is that there will be sufficient fish to catch before a river, a river moves from three up to two and indeed up to one. So, so if there's an absence of data, then we must not authorise the catching of fish from that river, given the overall picture that there is in Scotland. And in 1968, when I was a water bill, if we were worried about declining stocks. So it's been a long run issue that continues. That, that would be our view, of course. We, we, are, we are saying that, that, that uh, if we have got the River Endrick to, to 
keep coming back to that river. If we have got that wrong, then we are being more cautious than, than we need be, and the stock should recover more quickly, and we move, we move to uh, grade two. If, if, we would, if we were less cautious, if I might use the word cavalier, if we as policy makers were cavalier, then, then we would be jeopardising uh, the populations for future anglers because we would be uh, scared that too many were being killed. And internationally, um, are the, is, is it the same uh, in other jurisdictions that might be similar, and we refer to Ireland, England and Wales, etc., that uh, they will only sanction catching when the evidence is present and available? to say that there's sufficient fish to catch. Well, as my colleague, uh, colleague said, I think England are, uh, are moving to that. Uh, they've moved, so so this, uh, they are consulting now on a 10-year bylaw that will say uh, uh, for all bar 10 of their 42 salmon rivers, there's mandatory catch and release for 10 years, reviewed after five. Ronald Finlay. Donald, it's Donald Cameron. <laughs> Sorry, my apologies. <laughs> take that comparison. Yeah, it was a legal comparison, yeah. Um, could, I, could I refer to my register of interest and, and fishing um, therein? Um, just touching on something that uh, you have uh, that, that's come up this morning, am I right in thinking that you're working on the current model uh, in relation to... Um, getting more local variable habitats uh, in, involved. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yes, that's right. We're currently working, um, so particularly for the egg requirements, um, we're working on that at the moment to try and come up with something rather than an all Scotland um, number, which is the only information we've got just now. We're trying to produce something which will give us um, regional targets or, or we can see how we think they vary between rivers. So is there a danger that the, the, the well, that won't affect the 2018 gradings, but it, it, it will play into the 2019 grading. So is there a danger then that the 2019 gradings may be more accurate uh, than the 2018 gradings? I, I, I think hopefully every time we, we make changes and discuss with, with stakeholders, get ideas, get more data, it, it will become more and more accurate. I, I think what we're doing at the moment is using the best available information and science we have. Information can always be improved, science can always be improved. If we get more counters, for example, that gives us more information, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd, we'd hope, and once we bring the com complementary approaches, the juveniles that Simon mentioned, it, it will improve going forward. I think that's... Um, could I ask about appeals? Um, given the, I think, quite startling uh, move from 2017 to 2018 in terms of grade three changes. I think you're almost doubling um, rivers that have been graded two to three. Not quite double, but almost. Um, there will, I think, be a lot of concerned stakeholders uh, within the, um, the general fishing um, sector. Could you just explain what the appeals process for those um, stakeholders might be, please? Can I say that there's not a formal appeal process as such? There's not a statutory appeal. The um, the engagement, if you like, is um, first and foremost the 28-day consultation period, which I referred to in the autumn, as well as the ongoing discussions we have with individual clubs and, and district salmon fishery boards and, and trusts um, and through various groups, the Salmon Liaison Group uh, and the Local Biologist Working Group that we've had in place. As, as part of developing the model, so that um, last May, when I referred to the fact that the, the initial results were starting to come out for the set of regulations that are being considered now, the uh, local biologists group, Sam Liaison Group, I think, had, had accepted and were happier with the model as it's developed for this set of regulations moving forward. Now, there have been, as I say, 32 um, river groupings uh, have responded to the consultation and many of them expressed concerns. That's 32 out of 171 river systems which we uh, consulted on. Um, and, uh, and yes, certainly we'll write to the committee and, and summarise uh, the, the, the issues coming out. But it's part of the engagement is 
uh, in, as in with any other consultation that the government may undertake, as to say, these are our proposals, let us have your representations. We will consider them, and we have uh, read every single one of those, we reported to the Cabinet Secretary, but the decision is, is a balance taken on, on, on the weight of those objections or those, those representations against um, our proposals, if you like. One thing, I think I'm right in saying I'll be corrected by Jackie Bailey, but in 2016, the Loch Lomond um, Association had an objection upheld. Is that right? So what, what, hap what happens in that, in that kind of scenario? So, so it, it is, it's, la it's language. It, it was not... Uh, 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 it was... We, we reacted, listened to the, uh, the feedback that, that we were given. So in... Uh, it wasn't an appeal or something something upheld. In the situation of River Endrick, we were able to establish uh, with their feedback that we could change the wetted area. So, so what happened was the wetted area for uh, the catchment area was reduced, and that then means you obviously you've got a, a smaller area, you've got a lower egg requirement because we're talking about eggs a square metre. So it was simply uh, we were given more information and listened to that information and said, yes, that information you're giving to us is valid, we'll take that on board. And as I said earlier, I, I think there might still be... We have uh, kept the same basis for this grading, although I think the association may feel were concerned that we'd changed it, but we have not. Uh, I guess I know the answer to this question, but I want to tease this out on the record. Um, you come at this... Um, basing your decisions on the best available science, as you put it. Therefore, I guess it's almost impossible for an, an appeal, given that there's no formal process, to actually be successful unless those who are complaining about your decision can produce alternative science to challenge it. So I guess for all that people have um, voiced opposition to the decisions you've taken, I suspect there's not been one single change made on the back of that. Uh, as Keith was saying, we have we have made uh, uh, seven changes in in grading through this consultation period. Okay, sorry. Uh, but but uh, essentially, I, I, I support what you're saying because what those uh, seven changes were were a uh, a change in policy decision. So what we do is we do an assessment of uh, uh, the populations, taking into account lock areas. Uh, where there are on a river and, and the river area. And where the, we had a policy approach where if, if when you include locks, we would grade the river as a two, and when you chose the river only, it was a grade one, we used to say, well, we're going to make it a grade two. But we've said now, no, we accept that we will use the rivers only, and so when there's that situation, we will choose the rivers only uh, grading. But there's been no great change. If, if you graded a, a river three and you've had objection to that, have there been any instances in this case of that uh, grading being changed to two? No, we haven't so right. far had, uh, had additional evidence. As you're right, scientific evidence, more catch data to say, look, uh, 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 the, the catch to change. So had we in, in, uh, in the period from October until uh, uh, until we laid the regulations, being able to acquire more catch data from the river end rate, we would have taken that into account. Um, and we did make strenuous attempts from October to try and identify those owners and get it from the 21% we were missing. Uh, your two colleagues are wanting to come in very briefly. Can I just say very quickly, there are, are one or two other changes historically. For, so, for example, the, the Loch Lomond change was as a result of that dialogue and, uh, and, and the change to the wetted area. There have been other changes as a result of those sorts of dialogues. Um, so, for example, in the existing, uh, in, in the, the new regulations, there are changes to the outflow points for two rivers. Now, the outflow point is effectively the limit of the river, um, upstream of which we count the fish catches, etc. And those changes are, are made in, uh, in response to representations we had last year. And we gave a commitment exceptionally to talk to those three rivers. And uh, in two of the three cases, we were um, able to respond and, 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 and accepted that the outflow points should change. And, and so that's Although it's not, it's not the headline grading of, of the river as, as such, it is going to make a difference to the, uh, to the catches and to the fisheries uh, who are, are going to be able to, uh, to, to catch it. 
to, to fish in those rivers the, for this year. Stuart Miller and then very briefly, Richard Lyle. But very briefly, it, although not didn't happen this year, in previous years the NIF was consulted on a Grade 3. They came back to us and said these catch returns weren't put in. Um, we went through our records, uh, accepted those. The catches went up. Their grade went up from a 3 to a 2. So it, it has happened previously, even if it hasn't happened in this last year. Uh, yes, I think that's, I think that's right. The, the 60 to 80 percent, is that...? Yes. Yeah, right. that's Thank it. You. So they were at 2 pre right. previously. Right, can I read into the record? Uh, am I correct in saying grading for 2018, 48 rivers have fallen one level, 12 rivers have fallen two levels, five rivers have raised one level, including which I am absolutely pleased about, the River Clyde has went from a two to a one. Am I correct? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Just ask a, a couple of quick questions. Um, I was a little bit alarmed earlier on when you were saying that in relation to the Endrick, uh, there was 11 kilometres where you were unable to get data because you didn't know who the riparian owners were. Um, could you just identify which bit of the Endrick that is? Is that the Jackie Bailey bit or is it further up? <laughs> the Bruce Crawford bit. Uh, I think I, I, sorry, I don't have the details uh, with me. I'd need to write to the committee to give you the precise areas of the uh, uh, the river that that eleven kilometres. I mean, could, could I just say that I find that quite remarkable that you don't know who the owners are. I mean, if you're talking about the Fintry area above Bogside Farm, then the vast majority of that area is owned by the Forestry Commission. So again, I, I I'm concerned that you don't know who these owners are and you're unable to uh, to you know, to contact them and to um, establish proper data as a result of that. Can, can I... I'll just leave that there. Can I um, ask a further question, and that's in relation to the uh, EU Habitats Directive? Um, can you clarify whether the uh, concerns around the Habitats Directive apply to all of the Grade 3 rivers, or is it just the rivers that are uh, identified as special areas of conservation? <laughs> rivers that are identified as the 17 rivers that are identified as uh, special areas of conservation. OK, OK. So it doesn't apply to the wider uh, rivers? It doesn't so, apply okay. to the wider rivers, no. And uh, the actions that were taken in 2016, um, what's your understanding about their sufficiency as, as mitigation in relation to the Habitats Directive? to avoid infraction proceedings? In, in terms of the infraction, my, my understanding is that, that um, and Stuart may correct me on this, but formal infraction proceedings hadn't started, but, but the EU had, or the Commission had indicated that it would begin infraction proceedings um, and that we were conscious of that at the time. Um, I, I'm, I'm not, it, off the top of my head, entirely familiar with the exact stages, but the process had begun. Uh, and that's one of the reasons which uh, we introduced uh, which led us to introduce this set of conservation regulations and other regulations to annual close times and, and, and things like that. There's a, there's a raft of measures uh, that, uh, of which this is part. Um, as a result of us doing this work, uh, introducing the model um, and uh, introducing the, the first set of regulations, the infraction proceedings didn't go ahead and that there's, there's no current outstanding in, in infraction uh, threat, as it were. OK, so yeah, that was withdrawn. Over this. Yeah. OK, thank you. Final question from Finlay Carson. It appears there needs to be a framework brought in fairly rapidly, but the, the Scottish Government appears to have kicked the, the Well Fisheries Bill into the long grass. Can you give us any indication when legislation relating to Well Fisheries is going to be brought forward? Yeah, the situation hasn't changed, actually, from, from what the... Uh, Cabinet Secretary answered to this committee on the on the 31st of October. Uh, I, I could repeat that if you like, uh, to, which was uh, uh, there will be a place for the Wild Fisheries Bill in the current parliamentary session, uh, but ministers do not want to preempt a future programme for government. It was never intended to be a year one bill, so it is not imminent. Uh, we would have expected it to be introduced in around year three, potentially but a lot of the legislative programme is subject to Brexit consequentials, which we are looking at carefully. 
A final, final question for John Scott. Can I just ask what use the £700,000 monies announced on Friday will use that will be put to particularly in one sentence because we're pushed for time? £200,000 of that is for a Wild Fisheries Governance Fund to help uh, uh, boards to voluntarily merge or new boards to be formed. Uh, the 500000 is yet to be finalised, but a substantial proportion of that will be used for a new national uh, juvenile sampling strategy across 27 regions of Scotland so that we sample juveniles uh, uh, across the whole of Scotland. And does that suggest that the current system is inadequate then? Uh, uh, given it, that it now needs £500,000 to be spent on it? Uh, we won't be spending £500,000 on, 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 on the system, but we do accept that, that there are uh, inherent... Uh, 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 what's the word? Excuse me. There are, that there are inherent uncertainties in any biological model, uh, and so if we, can, if we can introduce a juvenile assessment model to sit alongside an adult model, then, then we can reduce those uncertainties. Okay, thank you. I thought it was one final, final, final question. Very quick question. Um, I don't know if you're able to comment because I understand um, it's um, a legal case at the moment, but um, you could perhaps answer the question as to whether there are any others. The Annan Common Good Fund is um, uh, seeking compensation for loss of the money that has gone in from the local fisheries to support that, that very good cause. And uh, uh, I think in in dialogue, I hope, with Marine Scotland about this, but um, can you comment at all on that and if there's any other compensation, whether that will relate to the, the fund that was um, announced on Friday? It, it, it won't relate, relate to the fund that, that, that was announced on Friday. Uh, so at the moment, we, we are... Uh, well, it, from April, we will move into the third of three years of compensation being paid to coastal netsmen. Uh, we have not paid any compensation to uh, netsmen uh, or, or angl angling clubs, uh, boards within uh, within estuaries or within river, and, and that. Half netters, doesn't it? It does. So it does mean that we haven't offered any compensation to half netters. Uh, Right, thank you. I just wanted that on the record. Thank okay. you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for your time this morning. Um, there was a number of items you've undertaken to write back to the committee on, if that could be done as quickly as possible, and certainly in advance of this time next week. Um, I'm going to suspend for two minutes now till we change over the witnesses. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back. The third item on the agenda is to take evidence on the Scottish Crown Estate Bill at Stage 1, with a particular focus on the Crown Estate's agricultural assets. Can I welcome Gemma Cooper from the National Farmers Union, Tom Katnack from Fockabers Estate, Hugh Hunter from White Hills Estate, Jim Innes from Glenlivet Estate and Brian Shaw from Applegarth Estate. Can I uh, point out that we are already well behind schedule today, so can I ask members to or ask short, sharp questions and to say to the witnesses, if you don't feel the need to, to respond to a particular question, then, then don't, as, if you feel it has been well enough answered. I think if we proceed on that uh, basis, we'll get through this in an appropriate uh, fashion. Uh, can I start with a particularly very obvious question, but it strikes me from the evidence that we've had that in a general sense, and I stress in a general sense, there will always be individual issues. There is a, a degree of um, contentment with the Crown Estate and Crown Estate uh, Scotland uh, in, under interim management in terms of the relationship with the tenant uh, farming uh, setups. Is that a fair assumption or assessment? Brian Shaw? Yeah. We've come from a position where we didn't have any communication or any say at all with the old Crown Estate. Now we have uh, established this group and we're getting on very well with the Crown Estate Scotland interim management. And uh, yeah, we like it. There are issues, of course. As ever. Jim and us, were you just wishing to concur with that? I agree. I'm a, can I say, like, it, uh, can we represent four estates in Scotland? Can Alpergast, uh, White Hills, Glenlivet, and Fockenburg? And we are the community of farmers, you know? So the working group that we've got going here, can, as Brian states, can we, we've come on leaps and bounds. And we'd like that uh, to be advantageous for both sides going forward. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning to the panel. Um, could I tease out what some of the opportunities um, now presented by the rural estate are? Um, the sort of examples, um, and some of us have visited some of the tenanted um, uh, farms and, and areas in the previous uh, uh, Parliament in the previous session and saw interesting models such as um, best practice in the, mod the managing of tenants, encouraging young farmers and young entrants, very important of course, and innovation and environmental well-being of the land or any other issues that you see as um, going forward as positive and possible. Gemma Coop. Yeah, I can answer that. I think in terms of um, opportunities and providing best practice, I think the estate probably gives a unique opportunity in that um, it's, it's mainly comprised of secure agricultural tenants, but there will be pieces of land that come back. And I think what would be really pos sorry, positive would be in future if um, the estate had policies that were more in favour of getting young entrants into farming and providing perhaps something akin to the starter farm units on Forestry Commission at the moment. So I think, I think that the Crown going forward has a really unique role to play in that and I think that's a really important opportunity because at the moment, generally, they're very limited. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Can, it's, can other landlords out here, you can, we're, we're quite fortunate in the Crown Estate, you know? Can they have a, I'd like to see the well-being of the estate going forward and tenants within it. You know, it, it has to be healthy, uh, but other landlords out there may be more scrupulous and can less accommodate. And so, can I think we have an opportunity here can show best pra practice to other landlords out there. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, I think the the new entrance, if you like, can there's a case possibly can it's in the presentation we put in, Jim, we put in yesterday. Can there's possibly a case for a subsidised rent can, to, to give them a start off. You know, but I think when you, you speak the, about the wider you can, as regards rent reviews going forward, can of sustainability for farmers, can the tenant the sector, you can due account has to be taken, you can the social infrastructure of mm -hmm. where you farm. Okay, it's, not about, it's not all about revenue, you know? Can we have to keep this fabric of these communities intact, you know, and it's, uh, if you keep the, the community intact and farming intact, the whole thing just looks after itself, you know? So it's not all about revenue all, all the time. You know, it's, uh, we have to be careful the way we manage rent reviews going forward. Uh, can, can I ask, what, one of the things that, that 
I have picked up in dealings with the, the tenant farmers in the Crown Estate is a, um, a concern perhaps about the, um, the factoring arrangements, that there's not an embedded factor on an estate, or even an embedded factor for the whole of the Crown Estate, that tenants can go to. Very often it's a local land agent or a locally based land agent, one day a week, two days a week, whatever. It, it does this all present an opportunity to change that approach, and would you welcome such a change? And on a number of times, would the uh, Bellsbury have their own factor? There was always put back that they would um, they would rel they relied on Savills to give them what, uh, more experience and more staff. I think I think we would be quite keen on an in-house factor, Brian. Didn't yep, we we have a we have a, a a junior factor that comes around, but he, as you say, works two days a week. Um, there's a problem with tenants not being able to converse pretty well. We're only just picking up on emails, but if you want something done, you've got to get it logged in and on paperwork. The, the, the general tenant will meet up with the guy who comes round and they, they will agree something and it will be forgotten about. So there's, both sides need to set up a situation where they are quite clear about what they want and well whether it can be done okay is that a generally held view that uh, an in-house factor would be a, a step forward in the case of that thomas at the minute and again for the state we've got a specific factor again from savills and uh again, Glenn, it's the same you know and uh dr wax but i think the fact that we've got this group up and running again it's a halfway house so tennis working group came a meeting twice a year with the crown estate and, uh, and we're starting to involve the factors as well. So we are the intermediary between. So there's accountability creeping in all the time, and it's an expanding nature, so that's got to be good. And can obviously we have meetings with our own tenants, you can in each estate, you can maybe a twice yearly basis, just as and when necessary. And up, up to date, it's been pretty well attended, probably 90% attended, and uh, the feedback from these, the, these tenants thinks this, this is good. Okay, we've never seen this before, you know, so, so far it's all positive, I would say. OK. Claudia, do you want to come in with another? Yes, thank, uh, thank you, Gavina. Just um, any brief comments uh, uh, on in investment and whether there is seen to be a disparity in investment in, in different tenanted farms and different areas of the Crown Estate. Um, I've, I've just, I have noted, um, Jim Innes, that you said that it's not all about revenue and I understand the point you're making, but... Uh, is there any concern that there might be showcase areas and others which might lose out a bit? <laughs> possibly comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> I would say I've got a guy farming in the state and going with it, but also yeah. farm, also you know, a farm down in Duffton, which is a different type of uh, ownership altogether. And it's chalk and cheese in the different landlords. And Crown Estate in the past, they were the bee's knees as regards to investment in farms. And obviously, with the, the way costs has uh, crept up, like as regards to buildings and all the rest of it, you can, there's not the same money going about, you know? It's, uh, but they're still focused on you know, keeping the farms alive and kicking and uh, replacing buildings as and when needed. Okay, so it, it's, it's still an ongoing situation. So. Can it actually work? So, but the investment has. Uh, can I say, Claudia, you can. Uh, it's not all about money, but at the same time, the farms need to be viable and uh, going forward, and it has to be. Can the buildings need to be up to scratch and all the rest of it? You can, but can uh, can. Uh, if you look at the, the financial thing going forward, can it's pretty good reading actually. You can you're trying to grow this. The state by kind of portfolio by two million, kind of 18, 19, up two million, and the revenue kind of net would be about a million. You know, so that's all good. But the, the rural estate, if you look at the the capital, I think it's about 96 point odd million for this worth. But the revenue from it, it's not very clever, really. You know, but that, that, that's farming. That's what it is. But it's it's a key area of the Crown Estate portfolio. You know, and it has to be looked after. We have an issue, uh, particularly on Applegarth, where it's, it's been taken over. I'm, 
my family have been there before the Crown Estate were there, and there's never been any proper maintenance done. Investment now is all left to the tenants, by and large. The, the, the Crown Estate do not invest in dairies or things like that, but it's maintenance we're looking at now. And, and we must have an, uh, an audit done. And I, I got a, an email from Andy Wells last night, and he says, oh yes, we're going to do an audit. They can't, they, if they don't know what the liabilities are, they can't do a budget. And there are so many underlying things that need to be done that have happened over the years. Not this lot's problem, it, it is their problem now, but it's come from what's happened before. So an audit must be done. In, we are having, or we've got the opportunity as tenants to do an amnesty, whereas we are putting forward our tenant investments. And alongside that, I believe, and I think we all believe, then the landlord should be understanding what his problems are because he needs to have money laid aside to fix the lead pipes that are still in the and, and the fallen down sheds. Claudia Beamish's question, there is a sense that there's an inconsistency in approach in terms of investment across the four estates. Gemma Cooper, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I do agree. I think um, in general, the tenants are really proud to be Crown Estate tenants. Um, and that's, that's quite refreshing in agricultural tenancies generally. Um, I think there probably is a disparity in what's gone previously, particularly Brian has mentioned the estate in Dunfries and Galloway, Applegarth. Um, and I think possibly part of it, though, is also about um, transparency, because there hasn't been a lot of transparency up until now, and it's, it's good to see those themes in the bill as it stands at the moment, because the tenants, they don't have a lot of input and a lot of understanding as to how decisions are made. And I think that possibly a bit more information would, would really help in terms of how they felt about investment going forward and the confidence that they have in that. Okay. Alec Rowley. I think Claudia's touched on this question, so I'll come with it now. But I was really interested in that question of an audit. Um, does the Crown Estate, or I'm assuming they've not had an audit, I mean, any large organisation will take a local authority. They basically would know the condition of all their buildings and, and whatever. Are we saying that that doesn't exist with the Crown Estate? Absolutely. They, they, they have... It's only when some tenant comes and says, I've got a problem, the roof's fallen in, that then gets put forward into the budget. There are many underlying problems that tenants are frightened, quite honestly frightened to go to them about because they think that they can't get the house. There's some houses that are needing quite, quite a lot of work. Um, but an audit would, is not a difficult thing. A crazy thing that they've done recently is a drive-by audit. Now, I don't understand this, there's maybe some technical, but the, the factor phoned me up, he says, I'm driving past your farm very slowly. He said, if you wonder what I'm doing, he says, I'm doing a drive-by audit. I said, you're a curb crawler. <laughs> <laughs> so how they can uh, value my farm or whatever part they are, and the snow was on the ground as well. And could I ask him in following up, because that was one of the questions I was going to ask, was really, you know, the benefits of the Crown Estate in terms of investment and whether there was cross-investment that, that, that targeted areas of the greatest need. Um, is that the case or is it not the case? I assume if, if, if the Crown Estate don't know the condition of their properties, then, then there's a serious issue there. Good man there, Mr Chairman. Can I open you in there? Because I think uh, Brian, doing Kenneth Applegast, they've been probably disadvantaged for long enough. You know, with up and down there, we just talk about some and Glenlivet, and you could say Glenlivet's a showpiece of the thing, you know, so we've been looked after quite well, you know. So there are, kind of, the, the agents do come round, kind of look at things, and they say, yeah, if there's letters can sent in the, the, this past six months period, can there's any issues, Jim? Can there's any issues you need to raise as regards with factoring the budget going forward, repairs, etc., etc. And uh, I reckon they've sharpened up the rock already, you know. So I wouldn't be too worried just yet, but, but Brian's quite right. Okay, we need this order to take place just to see where you guys are at as regards the finances of the rural estate. Can, can how much is needed to be spent, spent going forward to correct things, you know? And Applegarth and our fairness has probably need more money spent on than Falkenberg's or, or Glenlivet. You know, but it's, uh, as I see, I've experienced other landlord and you can, it's chalk and cheese. 
you know, but, but we need to keep that momentum going. You know, it's a, uh, you can, uh, the Crown Estate going forward, it should be an example of best practice as regards landlords and input and all the rest of it. And if you, if you put the money in, you will get deliverance. You know, the farm isn't healthy, if, 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 the, if, the, if, the, if the portfolio is healthy, the buildings and all the rest of it, can the whole community is healthy. Can it, and if you look at the environment round about, can it all filters back, you know? Look after farmers and the whole thing falls in place. It's, it's all, keep, all keeps them intact. Hugh Hunter. What, I'm on Whitehill Estate, and that was really bought as an, um, an investment, and the Crown have had a lot of money. We've had uh, open cast coal mining, but it fell. Um, it was when Scottish coal went bust when it was getting put back. So this, to, to be a... Um, the new interim uh, committees had to pick up the pieces and put in uh, putting, re-establishing some of my farm, but the rest of the state, there's a quarry and they've been able to sell land for uh, housing at, behind Rosewell, not far from here. But there's only three or four of us left on the estate, so we don't really... S we are more... We are out the way from all the rest of them, and I suppose we're getting managed from Dumfries now, so we're a wee bit like Brian. They're not on. They're not coming up to Whitehill as much to see what's needing done and what have you. Okay. I have to say, Mr. Chairman, can the fact that we're a working group and have regular meetings with the managing agents uh, and Andy Wells and company, can it, uh, that's got to be good going forward because we can actually tease out that negative aspects within mm. the portfolio of the, of the rural estates again and and try and get some more action going forward. OK, OK. Um, Richard Lyle. Yes, Thank you, Kandina. Can I ask, um, among the, their assets, particularly Crown Estate Scotland, responsible for managing 37,000 hectares of rural land uh, with agricultural tenancies, residential, etc. In your opinion, what are the wider benefits for rural Scotland of Crown Estate Scotland continuing to hold on to and effectively manage these assets? As I said before, it's self-explanatory. You can, it's, uh, you can, if you manage our assets, especially real estate, effectively, you can it pays dividends right down the line. You can social infrastructures, environmental balance, and the whole thing. Employment. Employment as well. But the whole thing is related to a degree. Can post Brexit could be a negative, you know. So it's it's, it's all relevant. You can going forward, you can. So it's a tricky question, really, going forward. It's a, in Brexit, it's a hidden area. We don't know what will happen with that. So I don't think anybody does. No, no. <laughs> sure. um, yeah, I, I think that there's there's huge benefits to retaining it as it is. Um, I mean, these guys have been really clear from day one that, you know, as I said, they're proud to be tenants and they think that this is a showcase. And I think this is a this could be a showcase for Scotland if it's if it's done right you know the positive could be built on um in terms of for the agricultural tenants i mean this estate has a huge number of secure tenancies a huge number of the what are, what are left in Scotland now um, and they provide opportunities and they provide long term security um and i think just in relation to you know wider food security for Scotland these guys are a massive part of the fabric of the economics of those rural areas um and really anything going forward, the emphasis has got to be on stability for them, particularly as has been mentioned with the future of uh, subsidy support and Brexit and all those sorts of things. So, yeah, I think it's, to sort of summarise, it's, it seems to have been functioning generally quite well, and I, I haven't seen any huge compelling case for splitting it up. So... You mentioned there only a small question, Kandina. You mentioned you're meeting them twice a year. Should you not be meeting them every month? Or four times a year to fix out the, the problems that uh, Mr Shaw said earlier? Yeah. Well, it uh, could be, but I think it started off with no meetings at all at one point. Yeah, and I know then, that. Then I got one per annum, now it's two per annum. Yeah. And, uh, push for more. Oh, you could push for more, right? No, you push for more. We push for more, right? Thank uh, you. Uh, I'm in agreement with that point. That's right. We, there are certain things coming up. They, they, go, they told us, Andy Wells said in his email, that they are now, after our suggestion, going to do this audit, or so we believe. 
but they would get in touch with us once it was organised. That's not the way to go about it. We need to help, organize, help them to help organise it so that the, the job's done correctly and it's not top down. We are now part of this infrastructure and we want to be, we are buried in the churchyard. So we want to be part of the decision making. Brian, I... Brian saying there, can you look at the Smith Commission and what the recommendations coming from there? Can it devolve in more assets can down the line? You know, although we, 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 are, we are quite clear about we want the rural estates to be managed from a national perspective. But the fact that we are involved in this now, you can, and we're halfway who's between the board, you can manage the agents, and can we, government seems to be buying into that concept, is delivering basically what the Smith Commission was suggesting, to a degree, mm -hmm. to a degree. So I think it should be built on as time goes on and expanded, if you like. You know, and the suggestion that you're making as regards four meetings per annum, but I don't think necessarily it's the same with us as can have meetings with our fellow tenants. You don't have meetings for meetings' sake, because say uh, that's the easiest way not to have a good attendance. But once you get can priorities come at the fore, something to discuss, like say consultations and stuff like that. I see yesterday there's a new one out as regards pilot schemes and stuff like that. You can that that's when you have a meeting. Can you get out? So you should be you should be pushing for more. That's my. No, that's no, my I point. agree. We be not, not not for meeting's okay. sake, but sure. some, some kind of substance to speak about. Well, you've opened the door to another subject, Finlay Carson. Chairman, yeah. you, you mentioned the uh, the possibility of this bill to to uh, empower communities to to manage the rural asset more. What, what is the view of, of the panel about uh, more of the, the management of the rural assets being carried out or being devolved to local authorities or other public uh, authorities or community organisations? And when you're thinking about that, is it something that maybe Brian Shaw down in Applegarth, the community, you could form a community group to, to seek to manage assets when there's been issues with factor in the past? Quite honestly, I've got enough job uh, managing my own business. But at this level, it's fine, and we can get some cohesion with the tenants. But we simply want to help the thing to run smoothly. We don't want to take over, and it works pretty darn good the way it is. Can I come in there again? I'm trying to hog this away, but you have to shut them up if you want to. You know, but uh, can, we didn't really want to see it devolved into councils forever. Can, uh, because if you take Murray Council, for example, they have a big enough job running their own show, you know. Can <laughs> they indeed tell off financially? I shouldn't have seen that because obviously it's been picked up on, like, but uh, you can immediately say um, the rural estates, can, which we represent, you know, it's a, it's a big portfolio and you need expertise at doing that, you know, and the expertise lies at Bell's Bray, in my opinion. They've been doing it for years and I wouldn't say we should be can diverting for the original can format in the slightest. As regards community involvement, it's about the same. You can have to get the money or the expertise to dip their toe in the water in it. There is maybe certain avenues, like the big trails or something like that, that they could you can take on. But as regards the rural farming sector, we see it as a no no. What about the interaction with the wider community around these estates? Because it isn't just about agricultural tenancies. You have an engagement with it at Tom and Till. You've got the village there. You've got other things going on. How do you see the tenants and the tenancies through the Crown Estate engaging better, or can it be better with the wider local community? Brian Shaw. We've created some farm, uh, some walks, trails. Uh, there was subsidy to help put that in place, but so now. One of the benefits of that is that we can regulate where the community come to rather than them just walking willy-nilly everywhere. And we make it an interesting walk alongside a river bank and the like. Unfortunately, the fishings, we have nothing to do with them. They're all let out and owned by different people. But um, I'm meeting with RSPB tomorrow uh, to do uh, work with uh, try and save this, the tree sparrow or the house sparrow or something. So th there is wish from people to talk to us, and we respond. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In the last 10 years plus, you can, especially in England, live it. They've been instrumental in big trails, walks, the whole thing. And we're ahead of the game. You can, other states don't do that. 
You know, so there is community involvement for that. I mean, so we had a meeting with the community association, I think it was December time, it was last year, and uh, that's, well, it was long, far back, and that was Richard Lockie's time. And uh, again, the farmers had their say, and then the community associations come in, and was all speaking from the same hymn sheet, you can. Mm -hmm. okay, it was all on a par, like you can. Okay. Okay. okay, John Scott, and I'll let you hunt around. Um, thank you, uh, convener, and declaring an interest as a, a member of the NFU, although not a tenant farmer. Um, in the NFU submission at section 9 says the group is not in favour of too much local community and local authority involvement and believes that the estate is best served by retention of the national management structure where possible. Does that absolutely echo your views? Do, uh, the, the, essentially, the structure as is, should it remain with, of course, the enhancement that you're talking about, um, developing community, stronger community links, would that encapsulate your position? Or do you want to answer that, Hugh? Um, I think we've said already, want it all to stay together. I think the community, my our situation at Whitehill is the community has been given one of the stead, an old steading to develop that, and there is. Um, the chance f f for the community to use it. But I don't... I, th I think the Crown, the Bellsbury team will have, will have to um, get better at publicising what they do with the local communities as well. I don't think there's a lot of things have been seen. We have, tr we have trails and things in some of the woods, and I think they need, they, they need to be um, better publicising that. Finley Carson, you finished that line of question. Sorry, ruling out the, the opportunity to maybe to come together as a group of tenants to form a, a community group, which you could then provide factoring services to, to, <coughs> to the to tenants in Applegarth, for example. That's, that's the next step, I guess. We've got a, we've got a, a, a group in Applegarth, and we meet and we, we deal with things. Um, but the farmers are farmers, and they, they, they don't want to get too far spread out. They, they, they concentrate on what they're doing themselves. But if there, is a, if there is some way we could help, let's hear about it. Thank you. Uh, Kate Forbes. Thanks very much. I just wanted to ask a question about the farm sales framework in terms of how decisions are made around the sale and reletting of farms in the estates. The new bill sets a requirement on Crown Estates Scotland to maintain and enhance the value of the estate and the return obtained from it. And at the moment, uh, for example, when it comes to re-letting, my understanding is that unless there's a clear justification for an alternative, um, uh, a unit will always be re-let for agricultural use, um, and the same goes for a sales. Any thoughts on whether the new requirements in the bill might have an impact on the farm sales framework as it currently stands? <laughs> Here. My opinion is that it, it, it should be left the way it is just now because okay, there will be circumstances that want to sell a farm and I think it works well the way it is just now. I think if you block that, you're, you're kind of shutting that off and it maybe kind of happen again once the bill's through. So I'd prefer if it was left status quo as it is at the minute. In terms of re-letting and sales for agriculture? Yeah. As long as the money is being obviously reinvested into something else, not to be, okay, not sell a farm and the money goes away. It has to be maintained somewhere else, the money to maybe in a higher uh, income for the, the Crown Estate. For Reverend Gemma Cooper, can I ask, what about the re-letting? Of, of farms that become available, should there be a presumption in favour of re-wetting a unit to existing Crown Estate farmers to perhaps, whether you break up the unit or not, to, to, to help strengthen the tenancies that are there as opposed to perhaps letting it, I accept the point about new entrants, but to someone who's maybe farming already out with the Crown Estate. Does anybody have any views on that? 
expect me to say yes, but actually we've discussed this. Um, Crown Estate have recently let a farm on one of the, the northern estates, and actually the tenants here are quite keen that what they call empire building doesn't happen. Okay. They see anything that comes vacant as you know more of an opportunity potentially for the younger guys coming in. Okay. I don't think it's the sort of thing that you need to have a really inflexible policy on, because I think that's one thing in all of this. And um, going back to Kate's question about the you know, the framework that's within the bill. What's become apparent during discussions is that um, this is a really massive estate. It's a hugely diverse portfolio. There's stuff coming in and there's stuff going out. And the ability to maintain that is crucial to its long-term survival. Um, so, as I said, you would expect me to say yes, but these guys have been... We've discussed this and they're, they're quite keen that, you know, it, it doesn't always happen like that. But can I, can I just push this question? It would be good to get clarity. Would there be a preference within all that you've said that the letting of a unit that becomes available to the next generation would be, for example, to the new entrants who are already involved in the Crown Estate, the sons or daughters of existing farmers who want to branch out themselves? Or would you still want it to be done on a wider basis? Well, I mean, I think there's, there's probably pros and cons to that approach, because given that the majority of the um, tenancies are 91 Act secure tenancies, then those individuals would likely inherit or be able to have farms assigned to them anyway. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to question whether that was the right route. Mm -hmm. Eventually. Yep. Yeah. Could I come on, Chairman? Uh, again, last 10 years or so, in the Forest Commission <coughs> can create starter farms, you know? So a lot of these starter farms are 10 year leases. Mm -hmm. And at some point, these leases come to an end. So I think a Crown Estate could be a role model okay. and create an opportunity for guys moving up the ladder. Yeah. And by the same token, the way you suggested, you can have a farmer's son branching out with their own structure. You can take it on farms. Uh, I think that's got to be a good thing because there needs to be a, there needs to be a wrong ladder system to, because that guy's going to these 10, 10 year leases. If there's no farms available, can they're dead and buried. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they can't get nowhere. But as regards to rental revenue, I know, again, Kate, you mentioned the fact about growing the revenue in the state, but due account has to be taken about sustainability in farms going forward, you know? And I think any farms that's let can end by building just a non-starter for me, you know? Uh, but the revenue side of it and the rents that's actually achieved, it's not about maximum revenue because all too often, sometimes in the past, they go for big bucks, you know? And three years down the line, the tenant pleads poverty and he says, this is no working. Can I need a rent review and a rent reduction to make it viable? So I would think as regards uh, you can new farms coming on the scene for let, you can attest to a rigorous plan, you can a forward plan of five years, say, and it has to be financially accountable and so it, it can't sustain the rent being offered. So it, you can say you don't have this three years' time bleeding poverty thing. It has to be sustainable. But it's, that, that maybe necessarily, does not necessarily grow the state. You can as regards revenue, because uh, you can as it always be with, with itself, you know. You can't have it both ways. OK. Right, thank you for that. Uh, Mark Roscoe. Just leading on from that, um, we took evidence from the government bill team um, a couple of weeks ago um, around the uh, proportion of net revenue that can be retained by asset managers and then reinvested um, back into estates. And the figure of 9% was mentioned, which seems to be an, an, an historic um, figure based on Treasury rules. Um, I probably know the answer to this question already, but is, is 9% um, enough, and how does a variation of that figure affect the motivations of managers? I guess if we have the audit done, we'll know. I, 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 I believe, initially, on in the part of the world I come from, it will need more than that for a few years. It, they're already selling off three or four farms recently, um, and that seems to be where the revenue that is coming from to afford the keeping up of the estate. If that's to be, that's to be. But the 9% I wouldn't have a clue about, but it, it, there just needs to be enough to do what is needed to keep the thing um, tenable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I say also that, uh, can, 
when that cross-subsidising element comes into the portfolio, again, in some parts of the state might be doing so well. So you can, if, if you grow the capital fund until 9% of it is too high, then there's not enough money left to, to divert, cross-subsidise subsidize or maintain the, the state portfolio. But to come back on one specific point as regards farm sales, can obviously it's, it's, it's needed at the moment as regards revenue, you know, to keep the thing <coughs> mobile going forward. But uh, we're not, and we, we don't agree with farms being sold in a central part of a rural estate because it, it starts off as one being sold maybe in the centre part, and then there's two, and then you get fragmentation creeping in. And uh, I don't think that's a good idea in the slightest. Maybe as regards farm sales, it's just to be really, really analysed in full, like in maybe one corner somewhere could be sold off, you know, so it doesn't fragment the state. But I think with the same token, any sales or purchases, can they should be using groups like this, can to consult with, you can. Maybe I'm being a bit self-important as regards the group, group here, like, but it's, it's all I do with accountability going forward and making the right decisions. Okay. For the benefit of the whole portfolio. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just go back to something that Brian Shaw mentioned just a second ago. Um, I, th I, I think you'd accept that what you as tenant farmers might deem as being necessary by way of repairs and restoration work, the Crown Estate might hold a different view over. So how would you envisage um, compromise and mediation working to come to a position that was agreed upon? Because inevitably there'll be differences of opinion. So how would that work in practice? Brian Shaw. Let's start by having the houses all um, to be up to a reasonable standard. At the minute, the tenancy, uh, the, the agricultural laws, I think, do not require uh, farmhouses to be up to the lettable standard. I think that's going to come. So I think that's it's heading in that direction. But there are some houses out there that are really not very good. Um, and as far as uh, maintenance and bring it up to standard, well, then I think it'll be quite obvious uh, what's been stopping it, retarding it at the minute is the fact that there's not been enough money in the budget. Well, this budget is we would do is derisory for a start, and it is not. We don't know where it comes from. I think it was just the same as last year, but it's only what some of the tenants verbally say. Oh yes, we'll do that. But a lot more tenants, the onus has to come back to us to really tell the, the bosses what the situation is, and then they can then afford, in a timely manner, the putting right of the estate. And, uh, investment or is totally relevant at this juncture. Mm. Get to see where you're going financially going forward. Gemma Cooper. Um, yeah, just to, to build on what Jim said, um, they're calling it an audit, I'm calling it a record of condition. But mm. I think if there was some sort of, this is a, a chance to start afresh, to my mind, um, and carrying out records of condition on all of the holdings, I think would be really useful, could then be followed by an agreed schedule of works. Mm. Um, and then that would obviously tie in with the estate budgets. Um, I think with regards to wider industry codes, there's a lot of work being done by the Tenant Firing Commissioner, which is about behaviour, and I think that underpins discussions already. So I don't, I don't see this necessarily as being a, a source of conflict. I think it can just be a discussion, but the tenants need information that they don't have currently to be able to be involved in the process. Mark Roscoe. Just going back to the points around the audit and how that might function, I mean, will the audit look at the condition of existing assets or will it look at the economic potential of those assets? So if you've got a farmhouse uh, or, you know, abandoned building on your estate, which on your farm, which could be used for bed and breakfast, but it would need substantial investment to achieve that, is that something which an audit would pick up or would it just merely be looking at whether that building is falling down or not and whether it can be retained as it is abandoned? Yes, it, it, it certainly will. Uh, it, the picture will be painted, and then a decision has to be taken of, of what has to happen. Sometimes they make buildings redundant and uh, maybe knock a bit off your rent. Uh, sometimes they decide to, uh, well, I've had a building renewed, but there are leases out there. That's a problem that the Crown Estate has, all landlords and tenants have. There's a lease which has to be adhered to. and. So if there's a building falling down that you're paying rent for, then it should be replaced, whether it's replaced in its traditional 
um, method, manner, is a moot point. But in the cases that I've had, buildings have worn out. I've pointed out to the landlord that these, I'm paying rent for them, they're no good to me, and they have put up something substantial. They've done good. But quite a few tenants are not able to push this enough. Um, and if there was a, a review, as Gemma says, then we'd all be starting from a level base. And some people who are behind, sadly, at the moment, would get up to, uh, up to speed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, in houses, it's maybe not there, like situation has not been used. You make the point that can there could be a diversi diversification avenue there for the tenant and can co-funded by the, by the landlord, by the, by, the, by the Crown. You know, that is food for thought going forward, but at the moment, what actually happens if a house has not been used and it's a sad old state, can what actually happens if it's in a prime location or a decent kind of spot, can they'll, they'll, they'll take the opportunity to, to sell that site, sell that house, can then grow the, the revenue, you know, just the capital budget. You know, so there's two ways of looking at it, you know. Okay. But going forward, as regards bed and breakfast and stuff like that, I think in Glenlivet it's maybe overdone already that you can, as regards say, hold accommodation. But in other areas, it could be a useful secondary income, you can to bolster. And any of these avenues is useful going forward post Brexit if, uh, if subsidies is in, was on a decline. You know? Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Donald Cameron. Um, thank you. Can I refer to, to farming in my register of interests? Um, how do you think tenant farmers should be um, represented uh, and involved in the decision making processes of uh, the Crown Estate in, in this kind of new, new environment? Do you, how would you like to, to be involved? Do you, is it the status quo? Is it um, more consultation with you as tenant farmers? Uh, is it a voice uh, on, on the kind of management um, structure? What, what do you see as the best way? I think this forum, we have uh, got about what, two tenants from each uh, estate. I think going forward is really essential because I think we can take forward, we can speak to the tenants, we can take it forward to either the, the interim board or direct the government if needed. I think so. We're kind of bells bray. Everybody kind of in a circle. We've obviously got to speaking round the table. We've got to come to good decisions. Yeah, you can give an evidence. Can it just shows you how far we've come? And the point that you're making, that's the way we would like to see it go forward. We, we would like this group. Can we are the community, the farming community, it ticks the, the Smith Commission box now going forward, and we'd like to see that in an expanding nature as regards decision-making going forward. The convener touched on this, and it is an interesting scenario, but if, if there was an, uh, a, a dispute between the tenant farmer and um, the Crown Estate as landlord, uh, do you think that kind of system would nip, nip, it, nip that in the bud? Do you think that would help mediate problems. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Um, John Scott. Thanks very much, uh, convener. And in light of the above, um, what are your views on the, the bill itself? For example, are additional safeguards or commitments needed in, in some areas or not? Uh, you, many of you have said that you quite like the status quo. You've all said that it is a privilege to be tenants of the Crown Estates, so you are already examples of good practice, but how do you see improvements um, being made, possibly? Oh, no improvements. <laughs> Brian Shaw. You say safeguards in the bill. We're, we're moving in that direction. The, the bill is providing... Um, a big improvement for us. We have seen nothing in the bill or, or nothing lacking in the bill that we're looking for. Uh, so we, we believe that uh, we're heading in the right direction and um, we're not propelling the ship, we hope to steer it. Well, on that okay. optimistic note, I think that's where we might want to finish. Uh, can I thank you very much for your time? I think that's been very useful and very constructive. Um, I'm going to suspend now for five minutes till we change witnesses for the next session. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, the fourth item on the agenda is to take evidence on the UK withdrawal from the European Union Legal Continuity Scotland Bill. Can I welcome Michael Russell, Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe, and his officials Kate Thompson McDermott, Lou McBrat Luke McBratney, and Helena Janssen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Mark Roscoe, can you kick us off? Yes, thank you, Convener, and uh, good morning to. Uh, Minister and, and, and officials, um, I'd like to, to pick up really where the Finance and Constitution Committee left off last week in its scrutiny of the issue of where environmental uh, principles and animal sentience principles sit um, in relation to this continuity bill. And I believe that Professor Page last week in the committee expressed the view that these EU principles would not be covered by the idea of the general principles of EU law uh, that are within the, the continuity bill as it stands. So I wanted to ask you, Minister, for your reflections on Professor Page's evidence on that and what your ambitions are now uh, in relation to taking forward these principles uh, in, into law or not. Yes, I, I think this gets to... Very quickly, uh, you get to the heart of, of the issue around environmental principles in this bill. And if you give me... If, can you, I just want to tease this out a bit. I've, I have written to the committee and responded to your question, but I think it's quite important we know what we're talking about, particularly because later today we will consider amendments to the bill, some of which uh, Mr Ruskell has one, uh, uh, Claudia Beamish has one. There are amendments to this bill, uh, there's more from Tavish Scott, I think, that deal with these issues. So if you'll give me a moment just to tease this out. Let's, let's try to put to one side the issue of animal sentiments, not because I don't believe it to be necessary, but because it is well covered in Scots law. Uh, and indeed, the first legislation on that was in 1912, the, the Protection of Animals Scotland Act 1912, passed when Asquith was Prime Minister and uh, McKinnon Wood was the Secretary of State for Scotland. Uh, and that um, dealt with, uh, it prevented the in, to, uh, actions to infuriate or terrify any animal or cause any unnecessary suffering. Because animal sentience is understood and is not a question in here at all. And there has been continued legislation in that, including legislation in 2000 and Six. So th that is legislation exists. And keen as I am on European matters, not every principle uh, uh, derives from European law. There are principles that exist in the law in Scotland. So uh, the question is, what does this bill do and, and what other things need to be done to protect environmental principles? And I think it's important that we look at that carefully. The first issue is, what does this bill do? Is this bill takes into our law laws that uh, over the last 46 years, laws and regulations, I should say, uh, over the last 46 years that have come from uh, Europe, of which we've been a part, we've been a part in making those. Uh, and, and those laws and regulations come into our law. So any law or regulation that is respects or is based upon the general principles or upon the guiding principles, and it's important to recognise those two things because there are general principles which allow action by individuals and there are guiding principles that have led to the creation of the law and underpin it. Uh, any le lo legislation or regulation which they have been involved will automatically continue to apply because they've been taken back in. So in terms of where we are now, what this law does, this bill does, it says that's all going to be there, it's going to be ours, and it's going to continue to affect us. So we, if we are moderately content with the situation presently, and things can always be improved, then we should be moderately content with the situations that will exist after uh, Brexit Day. Presuming Brexit happens, I just want to make that point, because I still don't think it's an inevitability, uh, and I think we should always make that point. So what happens beyond that date? Well, there are two issues that we would then address. Uh, uh, well, three, actually. The first is what this bill can do about that, and the answer is nothing. This bill is not about changing policy after exit date. It is about making sure that what we have now continues to be part of what we will go forward with. So then, what, what would happen and what would take place? Well, we could look at it in two different ways, and both are useful to us. The first of which is to say that the keeping pace power in the bill 
uh, at section 13, which is subject to a great deal of discussion and many amendments. And uh, you know, I'll be giving commitments later this day to, to ensure that the scrutiny of that is stepped up and the way in which it operates is, is sharper, because I, I believe that those amendments are useful and informative and will help to make it a better bill. Uh, but I still think the keeping pace power is important. And the keeping pace power in itself will allow us to continue to do things that are underpinned both by the guiding principles and observe the general principles. Uh, and if I might give an example of where the keeping pace powers come useful to us, it would be, for example, in the area of aquaculture. Uh, I know it's not the committee's direct responsibility. It's in the area of aquaculture where you would have a list of diseases of, of fish uh, that, that, that were diseases that required action by the Scottish Government, that list would change and does change from time to time as new diseases are identified or become prevalent. That's an automatic change within European legislation. But unless we have a keeping pace power, we'd have to go through a lot of primary hoops in order to put that in place. So the keeping pace power allows us to do that, and that guides where we are. So that's, that's one way that we could do it. But finally, is there more we could do? And, and of course, I, I entirely com agree with the Cabinet Secretary, Rosanna Cunningham's view on this. And she wrote to this committee on the 31st of January. And in her letter, I think um, at p p section two, she talks about ongoing consideration of how best these aims, that is the aims of ensuring that we carry through not just the letter of environmental law, but also its spirit, precisely the point you're making, how do we take these forward? And she says there's ongoing consideration. So are there things that we should still do in this bill to allow it to happen? Now we cannot, and I think it's quite clear, we cannot change European law, we cannot improve European law, we could keep pace with European law, but we should also consider if there's, are there are other legislative routes that are going to arise over the next year and a half to two years that we could use prior to Brexit to do things with this. And I think that's the area which we should now discuss and consult on, and I think that's an area which you know, I'll be looking at as we move from stage two to stage three, whether we could uh, make a commitment in legislation to make sure that that matter is considered in terms of future legislation. So I'm sorry for the lengthy explanation, but I think it is a very detailed area. I, I entirely concur with the view that we want to ensure that we are doing these things. This is not the bill in which we should do them. There are things in this bill that will allow them to happen and also to go on happening. We should recognise those and we should also look for ways for, to ensure that as legislation develops, as regulation develops in this field, these are consulted on and made more firm. That's where I think we should be. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for that lengthy response. Um, I, I mean, I hear what you say, Minister, in particular about animal sentience. Um, however, in the letter that you've sent to the committee, uh, you do acknowledge that the current provisions that we have over animal sentience, um, the principles need to be further strengthened. And in fact, I understand that there's currently a, a negotiation between Scottish Government and the Westminster Government in relation to the UK Animal Welfare and Sentencing um, Bill. Um, so it clearly is a, a, a you know, clear we're not complete in terms of our, um, you know, respect for animal sentience and the welfare provisions that arise from that. Um, however, the, the bill which is currently under consideration at Westminster by the, the EFRA committee there um, has deemed that the uh, provisions over animal welfare and sentience that are currently in that UK bill are, are insufficient. So uh, there don't seem to be any obvious, easy solutions uh, to enshrining animal sentience in our legislation that, that appear on the horizon um, in the immediate future. So I, I, I'm still at a loss to understand why the government wouldn't want to enshrine that principle within this bill rather than relying on a, on a piece of legislation which is being tested to destruction in Westminster and is being found, found wanting at this point? Because this bill cannot do what you wish it to do. This bill cannot change the existing law. It can take into, into our law those things that presently exist, but it cannot change those things. That's not what this bill exists to do, and if we were to, to write the bill in that way, then it would be a different bill. But I, I don't share the, the member's gloomy view of what can and can't be done. Uh, you know, I know that the Cabinet Secretary, for example, is in active discussion with the UK uh, government about the ways in which this parliament might be persuaded to give legislative consent to that bill, were that bill to improve. So I think there are things that can be done. There are MPs that 
Westminster who wish this situation to improve, and this committee can certainly say that it wishes to improve in that way. Uh, the only point I'm making is I'm, I'm not indicating that I'm content. I'm indicating it is not only a principle of European law, it is also a principle of Scots law, but I'm also indicating the ways in which we can and can't do things in this bill. And I'm indicating the ways in which we could take it forward uh, by a variety of other actions. Uh, thank you, Kavina, and good morning to you, Cabinet Secretary, and to your officials. Uh, could, could I push this a little further with you? I know it's been quite detailed, but it is very important, obviously, in view of the fact, not least, that I understand it's always quoted that 80% of our laws in Scotland, which relate to the environment, do come from the EU. Um, I'm sorry if that's not completely accurate, but that, that is what is always bandied around. Um, what my particular concern is, well, first of all, a point of clarification, if you would, Cabinet Secretary, about what other legislative routes you're referring to um, in relation to um, the opportunities to make this all more secure, and uh, if that would be put on the face of the bill. So that would be a point of clarification first, please. Well, there are many routes that you know, this committee and the Cabinet Secretary can and will take over the next 18 months. You know, some of them are, you know, I've indicated in terms of new legislation here and in Westminster. Uh, for example, there's consultation taking place in environmental governance, I believe. Those are issues, or there, is, there are issues of environmental governance being examined. The, if that leads to legislation, as it may well lead to legislation, that is legislation which this could be enshrined. I'm not, I'm not indicating that I'm you know, in any sense against clarifying and moving this issue forward. I'm indicating what this bill does and what it doesn't do, and I'm trying to make sure that there's a recognition of what it does, which is important, which is all the things that presently exist are coming into Scots law, are coming into our law, so we'll be enshrined in there. And there is a keeping pace power, too, for certain areas uh, for the decision of the committee and for the decision of, of recommendation of the, of the ministers. But there, is, there will also be opportunities to take this issue forward in other legislation, and that is the right thing to do. It cannot be taken forward in this legislation because, frankly, we can't change European law in this legislation. That is neither what the legislation sets out to do, nor would it be something that we had the power to do. I mean, I know that there have been criticisms of this bill about um, taking powers that some members believe it doesn't have. I believe this, power, this bill uh, takes those powers forward entirely in a legitimate fashion. But I wouldn't want to open the door of taking it forward in a way that couldn't be done. Right. Sorry, I'm sorry. Kate yeah. wants to say something about it too. Do you mind? Please, Kate. Thanks. I just wondered if it would be helpful, obviously, um, Mr. Russell's book is on the, the, this, this, this current bill. From a policy perspective, in terms of the work we're doing on making sure we can carry forward the environmental legislation post-Brexit, we're currently going through a process of looking at all powers and functions in current law and figuring out where the deficiencies are going to be. So there's going to be a lot of work that's done under that. And what that's going to do is it's going to mean we are going to identify where the problems will be in, in, in carrying over the legislation and what changes we need to make to make sure it keeps functioning. And we've, we've talked with the committee about this before. As, as part of that process, we'll need to think about how we could use the potential um, powers under, under this bill or UK withdrawal bill, depending on where we, where we end up, um, to fix deficiencies and to keep pace. But there may be wider issues that need to be looked at that require more than just using deficiency powers. There might be things where we actually need to make more substantive policy changes and it wouldn't be appropriate to use the deficiency powers. And then we may be in the, the, the position to be thinking about further primary related Brexit legislation. And that's exactly where the UK government are at the moment with their animal sentience, because they've recognised that this is about more than just retaining law, this is about changing policy and therefore you need to think about different primary vehicles to do that with. Um, obviously, the UK government have committed to consult on environmental governance. We're just awaiting uh, initial advice from the Roundtable on Environment and Climate Change, and we will be considering if we need to do something, do something similar. Um, if what comes out of that is a need to do, to do things that might require primary legislation. So there's, there's a range of different areas where we might be required to think about that, and, and this is all part of the process. So this, the, the, these are ongoing considerations, and we're factoring environmental principles, environmental governance, fixing deficiencies, all of it as a package to think what would be most appropriate to go forward. How, how advanced is that work? Pardon? How, adva sorry, how, how advanced is that work? Um, we are still working through identifying all the deficiencies. Um, it, 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 it is a remarkable amount of work and we are making a lot of progress, um, but there, there is a lot more still to do. I should stress what the timescale is for that 
recognition of deficiencies. I mean, the, you know, we will have, assuming that there is a transition period, and you know, I make that assumption without you know, the absolute clarity there is, there's probably a period between now and December 2020 in which all that work will require to be done. So we have something like almost three years to, to get our way through what, you know, there are estimates of, of, of how much work is required in that, but there's certainly going to be hundreds of items that are coming forward. That's why this bill is, you know, contains the powers it has, and that's why this bill is urgent, because we need to get into that position. I mean, the UK bill is trying to do the same thing, and it isn't passed yet either. Uh, and you know they will have, um, by an order, uh, you know, a uh, uh, magnitude, a greater number of changes to bring about. Thank you, Claudia Beamish. Um, thank you, Vina. So I, I still want to understand whether this would mean, if this, if this description of what um, yourself, Cabinet Secretary, and Kate have described went forward, would that then involve um, a Scottish government? Uh, amendment at stage three on the face of the bill in order to clarify that? Yes, I think I'm, I'm more than prepared to consider such an amendment. I think we'd have to work out what it said, what it committed itself to do, but it's, it's, I think it would be the right way to make a commitment, for example, to the process in which consultation or consideration of the ways in which the principles are brought into Scots law would be possible. What this bill can't do is do that, because it can't change European law. All right, so I still have my substantive question, which is probably to do with the fact that I'm, I, I just don't get it. It is to do with that, actually. But anyway, we'll, I'll, I'll hope, that Cabinet Secretary, that you do. <laughs> well, I'm, 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 I'm really keen to, to help you to get it. Thank you. You, know, you and I have worked together on issues yeah, like this yeah. in the past. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, I respect your position on this, and you know my position on this yes, is exactly yes. the same in terms of yeah. environmental law and what we need to do. What I'm trying to do is to find a way in which we can take this forward. The way we can take this forward, regrettably, is not in this bill. Oh, but question. I am indicating a range of ways in which we can take this forward. And between those two, I'm trying to find something we can put on the face of the bill that will meet the points you're making, the points Mr Ruskell is making, the points that I think Tav Tavish Scott has amendments on later today, so that we are content that the issue is moving forward, uh, uh, although you may not be content that it cannot be done in this particular piece of legislation. Right, so that is the bit that I don't get, why it can't be. And if I can just ask you the question, uh, because um, as a non-lawyer as I, indeed I and am an I. environmentalist, I think and hope maybe it could be. So perhaps I could uh, ask you the question and, and make the points, which are, I think, three. Um, on the face of the bill, uh, if it's possible to refer to the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights, you, um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, have highlighted in your letter of yesterday to our committee that, and I'm sure this committee will all agree, that environmental protection is a core human right. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, there could be the possibility of putting it, something about this onto the face of the bill in relation to principles of the bill. And to be frank, I am aware that Sc the Scottish Government does sometimes shy away from uh, putting principles on the bill because these can end up as a list and it can become complex. But I still don't understand why as environmental protection and precautionary principle sp specifically, but other issues as well, are enshrined in EU law and indeed ECHR. Um, sorry, not ECHR, the, 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 the courts, the, the EU courts, why we can't do okay. this. Mm -hmm. And finally, I would like to know, if you think we can't, why? Why can't we put them into either the policy memorandum or explanatory okay. notes, and what status do those have? Okay. Um, so I know it's a rather long question, no, but no, I know there no, are lots no. of other I, questions. I'm going to have an attempt to answer it, and then I'm going to ask Luke to correct my homework. Right. Okay. So it, and he will then he will <laughs> come right. in and add more. Right. First of all, in terms of the uh, charter, the charter yes. is already codified. Yes. It already exists as a thing, which yes. we can take and say that's it, and we're putting in there. And of course, the charter contains only one of these things, which is is, is the issue um, of the, uh, the the 
I've now locked, lost my bit of paper, but I'm pretty sure that it is the um, precautionary principle. Yes. It is only the yes. precautionary principle is there, and there are three other issues yes. which we would want to consider within this this, mm -hmm. this list. And just to be absolutely clear what those three other issues are, um, uh, those, those are Preventive the prevention and rectifying one. pollution at sources, yeah. as well as the pollu po polluter pays principle. Yeah. So those are the other three. So, first of all, that is already codified. That is within the general principle. So that comes in, and it's a set thing. The other three are not so co in there at the present moment. So what do we do with them? There's a distinction between the principles that have the distinct legal character, that's the one that's in the Charter, and the other three which are set out in the EU treaties. Now, they surround, underpin, influence the making of laws, but they're not recognised in the same way. If this bill were to recognise them in the same way, it would move that issue forward in a way we cannot do. We cannot make European law. All we can do in this bill is take what exists and bring it in. That's the process of Brexit. We can't break new ground in this. But with respect, Cabinet Secretary, aren't, if they're in treaties, then surely... But they're not, is gen the, they're the not the general principles. They're not general principles. The general principles are within uh, are a different category from these guiding principles, right? So what we're, we would be trying to do would be to create a situation which we could not do. I'm sorry this is so technical. No, I wish really it was a lot easier. Important. It would be a lot easier if I could just say, yes, we can do it, but we can't do it, right? And, and therefore, allow the, I've given you my explanation. I think it's a reasonably good one. Oh, in terms of the explanatory notes, I think that is a possibility. I think it is certainly a possibility that we can expand the explanatory notes to put that in. But I'm trying to find something that is more than that, yes. that could go on the face of the bill. And that's why I'm suggesting a, an amendment of some sort that commits to a process that, that makes sure this is not forgotten, not put to one side, but becomes part of the process of legislation as new legislation comes in, right? And the status of the explanatory notes with well, that... Well, they, 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 they explain what the bill is about. They can be taken into account in legal circumstances, okay. but right. they're not the same as having something on the face of the uh, bill. Yeah. And that's why I'm trying to find something to go on the face of the bill. So I'm not shying away from that. I'm just trying to find the right thing to go on the face of the bill, not the wrong thing that we cannot enact. Luke will now underpin in some way what I have said, I'm I've sure. got the wrong thing. You've got the right thing. <laughs> 10 out of 10 always can be there. I can't promise this is going to be uh, any less technical than the Minister's explanation, but I think it's important to understand what the bill means by continuity of law, and both the continuity and the law part are, are, are quite important. So in terms of continuity, what the bill aims for is to replicate exactly what is in EU law at present and how it operates afterwards. And that is often, that is as imprecise an exercise as the exercise of asking what EU law presently is. So a necessary part of that exercise is, and the government's quite frank about this, that where there are uncertainties or ambiguities in existing law, which would require to be re resolved by the courts, those uncertainties and ambiguities will be part of what is carried forward. That's the continuity half of things. The, the, it, it's continuity of law we're interested in. So what the bill does in sections two to four and five is it carries forward everything in EU law that we consider has legal effect. And that includes the general principles because the general principles not only can act as aids to interpretation of, EU, of uh, existing EU law, but they can be relied upon in challenges, challenges to public authorities acting within the scope of EU law and even challenges to EU law itself. Those are the, the general principles. The guiding principles are in a slightly different category, as the Minister explained, in that they are more in the way of an instruction to policymakers to take certain things into account. They don't have in and of themselves freestanding legal effect, and they would therefore require some uh, adaptation if they were to be converted into retained EU law after exit. And as the Minister has explained, that's not quite what this bill is about. So what the bill is interested in is continuity and keeping things the same, and law, that is, things which have legal effect. To that respect, and, and I think this is quite important just to note, the, the provisions in the bill about the general principles in the Scottish Continuity Bill are slightly different from those in the EU Withdrawal Bill, which would retain those general principles only for a single purpose, that is, as aids to the interpretation of EU law. 
the Scottish Government's position is that much greater continuity should be provided, and it is provided for in Section 5 of the Bill, that where there is an existing right of challenge based on one of the general principles, in whatever situation that exists before exit, that too is continued to after exit. So there's already in the differences between the EU withdrawal bill and the continuity bill, greater continuity and greater effectiveness provided for the general principles, but only for the general principles. That is the ones that have currently legal effect. Thank you. Moving on, Kate Forbes. I could probably join the dots in your previous answers to get an answer to this question, but I'll ask it in order to get a direct answer. If the environmental principles were to be included in the Continuity Bill, what impact would it have on non-environmental areas? Look. <laughs> <laughs> They're much better dot joiners than I am. Uh, so, uh, um, well... First of all, just to clarify that when we carry over the general principles, that will carry over the precautionary principle, which has been identified as the European Court of Justice as being one of the general principles, which, and I apologise for slight clarification, is, is, is different from what's set out in the Charter. So the precautionary principle is one of the general principles and that will be carried over. So as Luke has said, that will be a continuity. So we will not make any change because that is already currently part of our law. The other principles are mainly set out in Article 191, and what Article 191 does is asks that the Union consider them in developing Union policy. So the question then is, when we are out with the EU, should we be out with the EU, what would we want the obligation to be on ourselves and on Parliament to think about how we inform future policy development? And that is a change, because the, what, what current, the, the, currently the requirement is on the union to consider it in developing environmental policy. That's not all union policy, and that's not actually a direct obligation on member states or any public authority within member states. So that, that's what the current setup is. So the answer to your question is that we actually don't know, and that is what we have to consider. And that is why we need to go through a process of thinking about what this means, exactly what is the outcome that we want to achieve, and make sure that we've consulted on that and discussed that before we make any changes. This does tend to illustrate, to be blunt with you, the extraordinary and, in my view, utterly wasteful complexity of the process of Brexit. I mean, the conversation that we have been having for the last 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes, is, is just a small part of those conversations in which I find myself immersed in on a daily basis. Uh, you know, and, and that's why I, I would continue to argue this is a ridiculous process. That being the case, we still have to prepare ourselves for it. And the bill, and I want to stress this, the bill is a, an essential backstop in our preparation which uh, freezes things and puts things into a situation so there is no cliff edge. It is not a bill that develops policy. It, in small areas, deviates from the UK bill because we think there are things that need to be done in that regard, both in terms of listening to this parliament on issues of scrutiny and other things. But you know, it is not a bill that implements new things. If those bills are to come along and Brexit takes place, they need to come along and Scotland needs to protect itself, the best way to do so outside the EU is undoubtedly in the single market and the customs union, uh, and there are issues to be addressed there. But if that is what happens, then there will need to be new legislation of a variety of types, both in terms of secondary legislation that corrects deficiencies, and then primary legislation to chart new courses. Uh, now, those courses, in my view, will not be as good as what we have at present, but that's where we are. Donald Cameron. Um, um, Minister, you touch on this in your letter, so in a way the question's already answered, but I just wanted to ask you about Section 13 and the keeping pace power. But is it your um, forecast, as it were, that uh, the gen what, what might be called environmental principles could be um, embedded in the future by using Section 13? It's an interesting uh, point. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to treat it as a positive point for a positive debate rather than anything else. Um, the, the effect of those, of the guiding principles, put it that way, a particular effect of the guiding principles would be seen if a choice was made 
to use the keeping pace powers in particular areas because by, by the relevant cabinet secretary, uh, we're dealing with environmental issues here rather than anything else. It would apply to other issues as well, of course. But the effect of them would be seen because the items that were being taken and kept pace with would be items that had been developed, as has been indicated by Kate, in terms of the development of the policy on those items, uh, but with respect to those guiding principles. So the effect of them would be seen. I think we would want to take a clearer, uh, much more upfront view, as I've indicated, of how we take those guiding principles forward as principles per se, by consulting on them and by finding primary legislation with which to include them. But their effect would be seen in the powers that we would take under Article 13, with the approval of the Parliament. So I'm just hypothesising here. If, if, say, the EU t took a more stringent view of, say, the polluter pays principle, say that changed in the, in the future and, and it became much stricter, in practice, would it be the keeping pace power that allowed the Scottish Government to replicate that? N no, uh, it would only be replicated insofar as it dealt with a specific power a specific set of, of circumstances which the Cabinet Secretary had come to the Parliament and this committee and saying we would like to keep pace with this power in these circumstances. Remember, it's also not an unlimited power, so it wouldn't last forever. So it would be the effect of that principle which had, uh, and, and the outcome of that which had been cons uh, consciously chosen by the Government of the day and approved by the Parliament so to do. It would not, in those circumstances, be taking forward the principle itself. That would be for the Parliament to decide, once it had decided how it wanted to take care of the issues of these principles within law. Okay. Thank you. Um, Stuart Stevenson, followed by Mark Roscoe. Uh, thank you very much. Do the guiding principles already influence Scots law and policy because of what they say? rather than because they come from the EU? Deeply philosophical question, I have to say, which um, I, I suspect the answer is yes, but I'd really probably like to consult somebody on the issues of jurisprudence on that before I answered it. But it, it would seem to me that if you take the wider issue of development of jurisprudence and the way in which decisions of the ECJ affect courts within Scotland, then the answer probably is yes. But, you know, you are sitting next to an advocate who would be better placed to answer these questions than I would. I've tried, ah, Minister. Well, indeed. The conscious choice to apply guiding principles um, when considering uh, new keeping pace um, legislation, D does that also imply that there's a conscious choice perhaps not to apply guidelines as well. well, well it, it uh, and would, in which case, what would be there would your be a, judgment on that? Are there, are there opportunities to, to not apply the precautionary principle or not apply the polluter pays principle? Well, I don't think there's any opportunity sentence. not to apply the precautionary principle, you know, because it is being enshrined and is enshrined within the, the Charter and would come as part of that. <coughs> the other ones also influence the law which has been made, which is coming into our law, and therefore would be law that would, the, the judgments would affect future judgments. But I think you would also want to say, and, I, and I, I want to be very clear about this, there would be political choices to be made. My political choice would be to ensure that these are powers that not only continue but grow in influence. There are some people in, you know, I, I hope not in the Scottish Parliament, but there are some people in the UK who I think view would be very different. And we've heard those those views being given in terms of what they would like to get rid of in terms of environmental laws. So um, there will be political choices to be made. That is why one of the many, many reasons I think we should remain in the EU uh, so that we are in actual fact part of a progressive movement on these issues uh, rather than run the risk of being part of a regressive movement on this issue. But my view is uh, there are some things which we can with certainty say we'll maintain and some things we will may have to make choices on. 
But why allow that political choice over guiding principles in relation well, to keeping, because that is keeping a, pace provisions? That, that is a situation we find ourselves in. Brexit is a situation not of our choosing. Uh, but Brexit is, in my view, an attempt to diminish all sorts of rights and privileges that we presently have. And that's why it should be resisted. Uh, but I can't give you a guarantee uh, uh, of any sort, but I can say that this current government wants to do its best to ensure things move forward and will do so. That's why I've indicated we're trying to find a way to put on the, the face of this bill <coughs> the key issues that we can move forward, but what we can't do is do things that, that do not have standing or status or do not exist, because if we did that, we would be ultra vares in, in a variety of ways. So we're trying to do what you suggest to do, but this is fraught with difficulty, and it's fraught with difficulty because the process of Brexit is fraught with difficulty. And you can't look to this parliament to find every solution to that, because unfortunately, you know, the people of Scotland clearly voted against it happening, but they're presently being dragged out of Europe against their will, and that's the political reality. But, but with, with due respect, I mean, if we were to legislate now for a new piece of legislation that didn't incorporate Pluto Pay's principle, that didn't incorporate the precautionary principle... <laughs> but we're not doing that. We would, we would be in a difficult yeah, situation. I, we would I just be want to be absolutely against clear. We're the not Lisbon doing Treaty. that. We're so not how do we enshrine doing these guiding no. principles in we're, relation we're, to the keeping not, pace provisions? I really, I really want to be absolutely clear. That's not what we're doing. Uh, with the greatest respect, that is a misrepresentation, not unwitting, of what we're doing. What we're doing is we're taking the legislation which contains those things and has been drawn up in that way and bringing it back into Scots law. That's what we're trying to do. And that's what this bill does and that's what we, we will do. We are also, where there are uh, the, 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 the guiding principles identified, making sure that they're in, and they can be acted on because they have been the basis of decision making, right? And there are cases to do so. There are three other items which are not in that position, which we are saying we need to find a way to include those in primary legislation and we would like to do so. The, the Cabinet Secretary has indicated to it, I've indicated to it. But we're saying we can't do it in this bill because that's not what this bill is about. And that runs the risk of putting this bill in, in, a, in a very dangerous position. So we're not saying we're not going to do that. We're saying we want to do it. We're saying we're trying to find a way to do it. But we're saying it can't be done in some of the ways that are being suggested because that's impossible for this bill. I just want to make that absolutely clear. On that, uh, John Scott. Um, thank you, convener. Um, thank you, uh, Minister. In terms of uh, what is in this bill and what this bill is about, how do you see Section 13 working in relation to the issues within the remit of this committee? Well, uh, I, I think I've indicated examples? one or two of the areas in which that would that would be helpful uh, to this committee. Um, you know, I, I've used I've used some examples, but let me let me just tease those out. The uh, Aquatic Animal Health Reg Scotland Regulations 2009, with which you are no doubt intimately <laughs> familiar. Uh, I know you well, Mr Scott, and I know that such detail never escapes you. Um, uh, that, that means that whenever the EU adds a, a new fish disease to its list of identifiable diseases, we exercise a power under Section 2.2 uh, of the European Communities Act 1972, and we add those diseases to our own regulatory regime. Now, that's the sensible thing to do. I mean, I've been Environment Minister. I've dealt with uh, outbreaks of, 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 of fish disease uh, during my time. You, know, we've very, you need to act very, very quickly and very resolutely. That's the power in there. Now, we could lose that power if, unless we are able to take a keeping pace action. And the keeping pace action would be the Minister, the Cabinet Secretary, coming to this committee, to ex explaining why this is necessary, and the, you know, a process of scrutiny taking place, and then the keeping place power would allow us to continue to do that. And that's, that's very important to us. Another example that you will be even for, more familiar with is the issue of invasive species. You know, there is an automatic updating of the list of invasive species, depending on the identification that takes place within the European Union. Now, some of those, uh, you're also familiar with this in, in animal health, where uh, issues of animal health may arise you know, to the east, and may spread across to the West, as happens. And in those circumstances, you want to be able to take action without necessarily going through the hoops of primary legislation. So the keeping pace power in clear, practical areas is important. I don't envisage, and Mr Cameron asked me the question, I don't envisage that power as being used 
you know, in, in place of, of uh, in, in major areas where you would want primary legislation, but in areas where there is a sensible solution to be found, it should be found. And would that be under the standard affirmative procedure? Well, that is an issue that requires to be teased out in the, 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 the debates that will take place during the rest of today. You know, uh, it, it, there is a clear demand within the chamber, and, and we heard it from a range of individuals last week, uh, to examine this very closely and to find ways of scrutinising it more closely. And I am listening to that, and I am open to that. So, you know, that's a decision that the, that in the bill that will eventually come about. Okay, Mr. Scott, you got further questions? Um, thank you, and thank you for reminding me. I should have declared an interest as a farmer citing animal diseases as part of my knowledge sphere. Um, can you, uh, having very helpfully provided a list of um, examples that are within the remit of the committee, would you like to elaborate, in your view, what the implications are uh, for the environment of not having a keeping pace provision? Uh, exactly as I've indicated, it would be burdensome and it would mean that the speed of action, which is often required in these circumstances, does not take place. I mean. To draw, to draw across into another matter that you know, has concerned me very greatly over the last few weeks, it is a question of you know, how we would play these issues within a UK framework. Mm -hmm. If we were to have frameworks, which I'm entirely in favour of, then those frameworks would be able to take advantage of a keeping pace power that existed across these islands in order to put this in place. And maybe those, uh, the governance of fra those frameworks would benefit from making the ability to access a keeping pace power. So I'm in favour of that type of work taking place, uh, and I, I would have thought that if the keeping pace, the framework existed, but the keeping pace power didn't, you would find yourself with a much more cumbersome uh, and less fleet of foot purpose. And as we know, you know, in animal health, for example, mm -hmm. speed is of the essence, as is it is in agriculture as well. Of course, you're much closer to the discussions than I am. Is this something keeping pace that the UK government are considering? Or not? Well, I'm we were sure disappointed. You've made this point to them. Well, we were disappointed that it didn't uh, and doesn't exist in the current uh, EU withdrawal bill. We think that was a major opportunity lost. There appears to be an ideological objection to it. Um, but you know, the frameworks would give you the opportunity to at least discuss it again. And if one part of the if these islands had it, and it also exists in the Welsh bill, so Wales would have it as well. This might be an example to. To, to, to England, for example, it's a power that they should seek to have. Um, but we would certainly want to exercise it. And you know, on the frameworks issue, we, we, we recognise the need for frameworks to exist, in, for example, in animal health areas. Uh, we're quite willing to be part of those frameworks. The only difference of opinion is they have to be agreed by this parliament, uh, and that's what we still intend to happen. Thank you. Finlay Carson. Yes, Mr. Minister, you, you know, does including the, the keeping pace provision and the con continuity bill whilst no clause exists in the withdrawal bill, does it not increase the potential for different environmental regulations in Scotland? So what you've alluded to, you know, visa species or whatever, I think we're more interested in what may travel north to south or south to uh, north rather than east to west. It, could it not be potentially divisive and, and not particularly sensible to have, uh, both technically and politically, to have uh, differences between uh, well, moving I, at different pieces. Well, 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 uh, you know, there, there are already changes that devolution has brought, which this Parliament has been quite comfortable with. You know, uh, for example, GM crops, air quality targets, food waste targets, um, water framework directive. There are changes that exist, and the nature of, of devolution is that decisions are made by the various parts uh, uh, of these islands on the I I principle of subsidiarity, and these are the right things to happen. Now, you know, I would argue that actually uh, we, should, we should trade up rather than trade down. And therefore, the examples I've given are good examples to look at. I absolutely agree that the potential for <coughs> animal disease, if you look at variety, blue tongue would be an example. If you look at a variety of animal diseases in the past, you would want to make sure that north, south and east, west were covered. Now, I don't make decisions for the UK. But my view is that this power should exist within the withdrawal bill because it's a sensible power to have. Therefore, when I've got the opportunity in this bill to put it in there, put it in there. That's what the Welsh have done too. And I think that recognises the reality of devolution and we all learn from each other. I would like to see that power existing. I don't think it's divisive to have the highest standards and to want to continue to observe the highest standards. It is perhaps rather than div divisive an exemplar of what should take place. Okay. 
Uh, moving on, um, it appears from Section 5.1 of the Scottish Bill that it seeks to achieve the same outcome as Schedule 1, Paragraph 2 of the UK Bill, albeit using a different approach. Why is the Scottish Government taking that different approach? What practical difference, if any, does it make? Luke, I'm sure, will wish to respond. <laughs> <laughs> to return to some of the things uh, I was mentioning earlier, the, the bill expresses this in different ways because the UK government's approach is very explicitly to preserve the general principles as part of domestic law after withdrawal only to the extent that they're an aid to interpretation. In contrast, as I discussed, the Scottish government's approach is to provide that the general principles have the same legal effects, they attract the same legal status after withdrawal as they did before. For the reasons I, I, I gave earlier, this isn't a, a, a status that can be described with enormous precision, but what the bill, the effect that the bill has is that that, that status is continued after exit day. And that's the difference? That's the difference. OK, thank you for clarifying that. Richard Lyle. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Minister. Um, I, for one, actually, I'm getting what you're saying. This is all about continuity. You know, and basically anyone, if anyone can't get that, I don't know, you know, where they're going off. Um, can I turn to how the EU general purposes, uh, principles, inherent and retained EU law are given effect? I'm sure uh, Luke will maybe answer this question. Um, if, they are, uh, if the ordinary person in the street asked you, could you explain to them why have the Scottish Government chosen to retain the right of action and the power for courts to quash law and decisions based on the incompatibility with the general principles of EU law, section 5.2. For the fact that we're nice people, I'm sure that we'll want to answer that. The Scottish Government's position across the bill has actually been that in a number of the policy differences which Mr Russell averted to earlier, we, we've decided to provide for greater continuity, as we saw. So, for example, over the Charter of Fundamental Rights, it was an explicit decision by the UK government not to retain that, to, to, to limit its effect after withdrawal. And we've chosen a more maximalist approach. The, the same reasoning lay behind the uh, decision to retain rights of action based on the general principles. If I, the, the, the situation is going to be confusing enough, as the Minister indicated, without attempting to tinker with what already exists at the same time as doing the already complex job of trying to convert it into domestic law. Yeah. Can I also ask you, um, can you also explain how Section 5.2 sits with Section 7.1, which removes the ability to challenge the validity of EU law from which devolved retain EU law derives. I'm going to say a number of the same things, but um, at, at present, domestic courts don't have the ability to strike down uh, European law on the grounds of validity, and there would require to be some adaptation to those principles, to those procedures, on the point of exit if we were to provide for it. And that is why Section 7 has taken the power, uh, enabling us to customise domestic courts' ability to strike down retained EU law after exit. Section 5, at subsection 5, makes it clear that the retention of rights of action under Section 5 is subject to Section 7 and to any provision made under Section 7. Section 5 does, however, preserve a much wider range of rights of action than simply the ability to challenge retained EU law on the grounds of validity. So, for example, the retention of the general principles under Section 5 would allow you to challenge administrative action by a public authority on the grounds that it didn't comply with one of the general principles, and that is unaffected by Section 7. You also have to recognise, as part of the context of this, Mr Lyle, that there is um, an antipathy to the European Court of Justice and its rulings within the motivation for Brexit, which is largely not shared within Scotland. Uh, you know, and, and there's a very effective Scottish judge on the court. Uh, the court itself is not seen as inimical to Scottish interests. And in, indeed, you know, there are a wide range of areas in which we have been greatly helped by the existence of the court. So there is a context within the policy making which we profoundly disagree with. Uh, and therefore, we would want to make sure that we're not continuing to express that antipathy in ways that are unhelpful to the ordinary citizen. Thank you, Minister. 
Uh, Kate Forbes. Thanks very much. I have a brief question and then a slightly longer question. Um, firstly, thank you for getting the response to our letter back so quickly. Uh, and just for the record, because it wasn't touched on in your response, can you confirm that the principles in the Charter of Fundamental Rights can be modified by the powers in Section 11 as part of the domestication process, insofar as necessary to deal with a deficiency or making the law work properly? The short answer is yes. The Charter will form part of retained devolved law after withdrawal and will therefore be subject to the, the powers which can operate on retained devolved law. I should emphasise, though, that this, this is not done in anticipation of any concrete plan by the Scottish Government to change the Charter of Fundamental Rights or any of its provisions. The extent to which the Charter is currently entrenched and not modifiable is a product of the fact that it belongs to a supranational institution over which we don't have influence. It is the, the, a necessary effect of uh, domesticating instruments like the Charter, instruments like the, the, the corpus of retained EU law, that they will become subject to the powers of this Parliament. Um, it's my longer question, which was to be, um, under what circumstances would you envisage modification to the Charter? None. The incorporation of the Charter, none at present. The incorporation of the Charter is very specifically limited by Section 5, Subsection 1, so that it has effect, as it has effect immediately before exit day in EU law, and as it relates to anything to which Sections 2, 3 or 4, which are the three principal sections that domesticate the law, uh, applies. So the, the, the effect of the Charter after exit day will be limited. It will be limited to effectively the subject matter of the Continuity Bill. OK, thank you. I have another, uh, for the record, question, just to get clarity. Um, it, it appears that both the UK Bill and the Scottish Bill allow but don't require courts to take account of decisions of the ECJ post-exit. So why is the Scottish Bill drafted differently to the UK Bill on this one? And again, what are the practical differences achieved? <laughs> the provision made for the interpretation of law, retained devolved EU law under the Bill, is in practice very similar to that made under the EU Withdrawal Bill. The Scottish Government does not think it would be appropriate to put a higher or more stringent test into the bill requiring on some unspecified for now grounds the courts to apply law in more strict circumstances or in particular circumstances. As I've said, the, 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 there, there, there is an inherent imprecision involved in the exercise. Um, Mr Russell mentioned the British judge, the Scottish judge, on the general court of the Court of Justice at the moment. Judge Forrester gave a speech recently it's, um, on the Scottish Council of Law Reporting website, if you can see a copy, where he describes the current state of EU law as a mass of tangled wires, and all we can really do is try to transfer them from one place to another. For that reason, we think that the best way of retaining the court's existing ability to bring precision to where there's imprecision is to empower the courts, as is done under Section 10, to um, take into account where they consider it appropriate and not to where they don't. I, I, the Scottish Government doesn't consider there'd be much value in going further than that. So essentially it achieves the same purpose? It achieves broadly the same purpose. There's one um, dis difference between Section 10's interpretation provisions and the corresponding interpretation provisions in the EU Withdrawal Bill, which is that um, we would continue to apply the interpretative obligations under Section 10 to retained EU law as it's developed under the Bill by default. Under the UK Bill, when law is modified, by default, the interpretative obligation falls away. We've chosen to, to change the default rule. But the default rule only, both rules can be disapplied. OK. Right. Thank you for that. John Scott. And so, in the particular, rather than the general, how will the incorporation of these general principles of EU law impact the policy areas, again, covered by this committee's remit? Member states are already bound by the uh, general principle of the EU law. That influences the way that they interpret and apply the laws. Through this bill, the bill that we're trying to put in place, and you know, you know, I don't overclaim for this bill, because this bill cannot change policy, but these principles retain for all purposes and incorporated into our law. 
So in the end, there'll be no practical difference in how these principles impact on the policy areas covered by the committee. Um, they will simply form part of Scots law rather than st the status being EU law. Now, uh, that means, for example, perish the thought that uh, you know, acts of Scottish ministers, acts of public authorities can still be struck down if we haven't uh, applied the general principles that are incorporated. So the responsibilities to observe the law remain unchanged. But that law goes from being the status of EU law and is folded into our law. That's, that's the process we're engaged in. We're engaged in the process of saying that there shouldn't be a cliff edge. Because if we didn't do this, I suppose this is the easiest way to understand this, if we didn't do this, we would get to whatever date it is that everything finally changes, and there wouldn't be any law if we just sat on our hands. You know, and if the UK government sat on their hands, there wouldn't be any law. There would be a cliff edge. We wouldn't know. So we have to convert this into the situation here. Now, the issue of deficiencies arises when the con conversion won't work properly and something has to be changed. Uh, for example, on agricultural policy, you know, re referring to the Common Agricultural Policy and the Council of Ministers you know, doesn't work because that won't exist. So how do we change that? That's the issue. But it is a, a standstilling, a freezing. That's why the word freezing is used. It is a freezing and, and moving in rather than anything else. Now, then there is the issue of what changes you would like to bring and in what way. Some of those changes are forced upon you because of, of, of the fact that, that there are deficiencies and incompatibilities. And other changes are things such as the change we're talking about, principles where you will want to be able to do something stronger uh, more, uh, more effective, and you will want to make sure that you do that. Um, and that is you know, a process with which the Cabinet Secretary for, 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 for uh, Rosanna Cunningham will want to be engaged on with the committee. But those deficiencies and incompatibilities are a matter for another day. Um, but you would say that there would be no change effectively to uh, the policy areas covered by this committee. We you start off in that position because that's where follow. we are. And remember, you know, there are issues, uh, Mr Scott will be aware, where if there is divergence and there is regulatory divergence, there will be a price to be paid for that, you know, either in terms of export or, or in terms of um, uh, uh, principles and, and, and in terms of, of standards. That is the issue of regulatory divergence, which also applies to the issue of the Northern Irish border, which then becomes very complex and worrying. Thank you. Uh, final question, Mark Roskell. Thank you. Um, Minister, the bill doesn't deal with uh, governance, um, and, and you've touched on that al already for the reasons why that is. Um, can you outline then what the, the process will be for filling that governance gap? Because at the moment, you know, the, the potential for a cliff edge is there if we don't have adequate, um, you know, monitoring, scrutiny, enforcement powers. Yeah. Uh, well, quite clearly, you know, Rosanna Cunningham you know, has written to this committee on this issue, has made it clear that this is an issue that now requires some urgent approach. Uh, she's currently seeking advice from the Roundtable on Environment and Climate Change. She's asked for initial advice on that, and indeed, uh, such is the, 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 the coincidence of circumstance that she and I will both be in front of this committee again next week, uh, and we'll be looking at the, and sh that will give her the opportunity to discuss environmental principles and governance following Brexit, should that take place. So she is fully cited on that. She wants to discuss that with the committee. She is taking advice on that, and she will bring forward, after consultation, I'm sure, uh, the, the solutions which will arise from this committee and elsewhere. But that's an issue that will have to be tackled, and it will have to be tackled in the next, certainly in the next couple of years, to put it in place post-exit. Do you see there being a risk that there will be a gap? Uh, well, there shouldn't be a gap, and there mustn't be a gap, and that's what she is working towards. You know, this is a set of circumstances not of our making, and therefore we have to respond to them. But uh, nobody wishes there to be a gap, just as a continuity bill will create they, 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 they will, will make sure there is no legislative cliff edge. She will want to put in place arrangements, no doubt listening to this committee. That means there is no governance cliff edge. So will there be clarity on day one 
or even before that date, as to what the roles and functions of institutions will be in terms of there, there will require to be clarity sanctions. on those matters, obviously. But I, I then I don't want to stress into her areas of responsibility. You know, I, I am clear what my responsibilities are. Uh, she has a responsibility of taking this forward. She and I, as I say, are appearing in front of you next week, and we will, in our respective roles, be able to answer those questions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you for your time this morning. That, that has been, I think, very helpful in clarifying a number of questions that the committee had. Um, at its next meeting on March the 20th, the committee will consider the Conservation of Salmon Scotland Amendment regulations and will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform and, as we just heard, the Minister for UK Negotiations on Scotland's place in Europe on the environmental implications for Scotland of the UK leaving the EU. We now move into private session and I ask the gallery be cleared.